Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. We are very glad that a lot of people are joining in here. So today's session is information in a photon. Uh, the instructor myself is Tiju Cherry and John. I am a research scientist at the University of Arizona. And we have a co-instructor, Jack Postlewait. He is a graduate student at the same university. And let's start. So for the prerequisites and goal, uh, remember that this is a level three course. That means there are a few prerequisites like uh, basic complex numbers, probability theory, some linear algebra and some quantum mechanics. This last, uh, we'll be using a few results from probability theory and the basics of quantum mechanics like state, vector, measurement, etc., and some linear algebra and the complex number, basically addition only, nothing more than that. Uh, then the goals. The goals of the session, we will initially talk about uh, coherent states of light and uh, modulation format. We will explain what these things are, but just if uh, you are already aware of some of these uh, concepts, so we are going to deal with uh, a communication system and uh, what kind of light we can use. An example of light which we use uh, is coherent state. Then the modulation formats and then detection methods. What are the de de different detection methods available for us? And uh, then we talk about the information channel and the capacity of a, an information channel. Uh, so let's start. Let's say we want to send a message. And uh, suppose, let's say you have a uh, information source and you have a transmitter and then you have some, that this transmitter sends some signals and or there are some noise coming in because of the medium, whatever is the problem, whatever, whatever is happening here. And then a distorted signal is received at the end and you want to make some measurement at the end. So this receiver, what it does is that it receives all this signal, whatever it may be, it can be, uh, you know, uh, radio waves, it can be optical signal, whatever. We'll talk a little bit about what are the different ways we send it uh, when Jack takes over in the first, in a few minutes. And, but at the end, whatever is the signal received here, our receiver makes some measurement and uh, you know decides uh, according to some earlier set rules, what is the signal received and then it is reconstructed back here. Okay, So you want to send a message. In this case, it was this kind of a message and it gets transmitted and uh, at the end you want to get the same thing. So our idea in this talk is to look at this part, the transmitting, and receiving part, and of course, some uh, including the taking account to the noise also, and understand how can we do this. And we try to develop a mathematical theory of this thing and uh, with some examples in mind. We always work with some examples only. This is not the most general theory, but this should give an idea what's happening here and uh, what can we do with light. All right. So this is basically this part is what we, we are going to uh, discuss in this course. All right. So first things first, light. We are mainly going to use light to send information. So the title of the course itself is information in a photon. How can you encode information in a photon and how can you detect or, or receive those information reliably from the light? So uh, light is a quantum object. So if you do some measurement here, okay, the moment you do a measurement on a quantum object, it loses its property. You know, we call it state collapses. Uh, and uh, it loses all the information once we make the measurement. So the question is, what can you do before doing the actual measurement? Okay, what can you do here while transmitting? Like, what can you do before the actual measurement so that you can uh, you can increase your capacity? You can increase the amount of information uh, you send. So that's the whole premise of this course. What to do before we do uh, actually make a measurement so that you increase your capacity. Then uh, that's it about. Before we delve into the main topics, I'd like to recall a few facts from uh, quantum mechanics and uh, probability theory. Let's start. So a state of a quantum system for whole the entire talk, we are going to deal only with pure states, okay? So a pure state in a, uh, actually a, a Hilbert space, but a you can think of a complex vector space like, you know, uh, CN, uh, and the unit vectors in this complex vector space are known as uh, states, okay? And uh, we get the complete knowledge of our system from this 
uh, vector which we have. If you have a vector, uh, for if you think of it as a unit column vector, we write it in this notation, ket, ket c, and there is a there is kind of an opposite notation here. This is just a row vector. If you think of uh, vectors in CN, uh, if you think of it as uh, this ket c as a column vector, and then this is called the bra c, and this is a this is the row vector which is the complex conjugate of c. Okay. Unit norm condition can be written like this, the scalar product. This notation we use for the scalar product between scalar product, we can call it inner product, whatever, uh, between C with itself is one. That is the new unit norm condition. One example is you consider your two dimensional uh, vector space where you have the usual scalar product. And let's say the basis, one basis you fix for this side, you fix the basis, you write it as ket zero. And this is ket one. So recall that ket zero is not the zero vector. It is a unit vector in this two dimensional space. Okay, that should be made, made clear now itself. And you have another unit vector C. Whatever, there are many unit vectors in this space and uh, a unit vector in this space, for example, is a quantum state. Okay. And uh, the ket zero for us in this uh, picture is one zero and ket1 is 0, 1. And the scalar product between ket1 and ket0 ket and ket1 is just, uh, that is same as 1, 0 here because we have only real vectors, real numbers in these vectors. And uh, that is 0, they are, that is what is called orthogonal or orthonormality when you think that these are of unit norm. And the ket c can always be written as a uh, vector, unit column vector here, okay? So with the property that alpha square plus beta square is equal to one, that is a unit norm condition in this setting. So especially when you deal with light, especially the coherent states, we will have to go through, go to infinite dimensions. That just, that will just mean that you will have vectors zero, like vector one, ket two, ket three, et cetera, and infinitely many, co many of them, okay? Uh, all the natural numbers, including zero. Uh, ket of all of them. Uh, we can try to visualize that in the further slides. Now, uh, a little bit background on the probability theory and random variables. Uh, so we need to, essentially these are all recalling. Um, so a discrete random variable K is uh, a random, a function from a, uh, you know, sample space, which takes values in zero, one, up to infinity, that is discrete values, a function which takes discrete values. That is what discrete random variable for a, a uh, discrete random variable. And uh, uh, for an example, example, you can just take any numbers which add to one, okay? Uh, that is the probability uh, of receiving k. This this notation is called pkk, is the probability of the number k appearing, okay? In that, in the range of this one, that is what uh, pkk, that all, the whole thing to show, should sum to one. Then the mean, mean of a, uh, of this random variable k is just the uh, so the random variable takes value 0 1 2 etc these are the values and each value is taken with a specific probability p k k and you just you know multiply that number the value with the probability and sum it over that is what you call as the mean of a random variable the variance we will not use as such a lot here but still uh, when we talk about gaussian distribution we should know what is the variance of a random variable but essentially it is just k minus expectation of k the whole square then the mean of that okay so mean of this function is the uh, expectation and mean of this function the k minus ek the whole square is the variance this here, you can see that both are lambda written here. That is because we are going to specialize to a particular kind of uh, discrete random variable called Poisson distribution. We'll come to that later. Okay. So in general, these are not same. This lambda and this lambda, these are not same. So uh, this right side, whatever he is here, what the, whatever is here, this is going to be there only for an example. Okay. So yeah. Then we talk about continuous random variable. For continuous random variable here, you know, the random variable was taking values in uh, the discrete set 0, 1, 2, infinity. And here, the random variable can take any real number as, okay, any real number between minus infinity and plus, plus infinity. Example of such a probability density function is uh, your normal distribution, okay, the Gaussian distribution, which we all know. And uh, that is an example of a continuous random variable. And uh, the no if you write the, your probability mass function of the Gaussian like this, then the expectation of x is this is this part is clear. This part is for any random variable. Okay, expectation of x is integral minus infinity to infinity x p x dx. There's a dx which is missing here. 
and uh, for a gaussian random variable which is given like this it is going to be mu whatever number come which comes here okay and the variance is just just like this one you know the um, uh, x minus ex the whole square px dx that integral the that is called sigma square in the case of gaussian it is sigma square okay now uh, the Poisson random variable. What is a Poisson random variable? This is an important uh, concept for us. We are going to use it throughout the uh, this lecture. Okay, a Poisson random variable is a random variable which takes values. It's a discrete random variable first of all, and uh, probability of k. Okay, the k is a number between zero and infinity. Is e to the power minus lambda lambda to the power k divided by k factorial for a fixed lambda. Okay, if the your mass function is like this, okay? If your mass function is like this, you call that as a Poisson random variable with lambda as your parameter. And then what happens is that that lambda itself is the mean and variance of this uh, probability distribution. Uh, similarly, uh, we have the Gaussian and then there's a theorem from probability theory for large values of lambda, okay? So for large values of lambda, you can approximate the, you know, Poisson random variable or the probabilities of this thing using the normal distribution. This is one important fact which will be, which we will be using. Okay, uh, just recall that for large lambda parameters, we can approximate a Poisson random variable with using the normal distribution. So there is a if you want to see this in action, like you know there are some nice plots available in this website. Uh, maybe one can uh, go there and see when we get a chance. All right, now uh, measurement. So this is another, so one important concept for us. So there are two things which we already discussed. That is a state of a quantum system. We are going to deal only with pure states. Second thing is basic probability, Poisson random variable and uh, Gaussian distribution. These are the two main things we are going to use. And you have the uh, this approximation theorem. Third is third important uh, uh, concept for us is the measurement, the idea of measurement in quantum mechanics. So a measurement for us in this uh, talk, we are going to deal only with what is known as the Wonnerman measurements. Okay, Wonnerman measurement on a state is described by a set of unit orthonormal vectors. Okay, so we just saw in the first slide that if you write ket zero and ket one, these orthogonal vectors in uh, your R2, that set can be thought of as a Wonnerman projective measurement. Okay. And uh, this is the orthogonality condition, orthonormality, I should say, because I'm taking the scalar product between WK and WJ, when K naught is equal to, uh, WK and WJ is delta IJ, this is the direct delta, meaning when K is equal to J, you get one, and otherwise it is zero. For the distinct WK and WJ, if you take, that their scalar product is zero. That means they are orthogonal. Then, if a state C is measured with respect to this, you know, uh, measurement, it just, then the kth outcome, I mean, uh, kth outcome means when you do a measurement, so this is your measurement basis. After you do a measurement, you get one of these states, okay? One of these states, that's your outcome. That is a vector, one of the measurement basis. And that outcome, WK, that is the kth outcome, appears with the proper with the probability, this one, okay? WK, so C, recall that is a unit vector. And this is a also a unit vector. Those this scalar product is always a number between uh, a, a number of modulus uh, between zero and one. So absolute value square of this scalar product, okay, is the probability with which you measure the uh, kth outcome. So this is a basic fact from um, quantum mechanics. And uh, also we have one more condition. This all comes from the idea that the ket vector C could be expanded using you know uh, this orthonormal basis so this is where I, I wrote here as a set of orthonormal unit orthonormal vectors that actually that will span all of your you know space so a monoman measurement will help us to write any unit vector as a linear combination okay of these uh, unit vectors this is just uh, you know basic inner product space theory it can be done in the infinite dimensions as well so uh, what can be seen is that a ket vector C can be expanded with these probabilities and then these uh, vectors, okay? And the, what to remember here is, this is the, this PK, that is this number, is the probability with which the kth outcome of the measurement, that is WK is 
received when you measure C. So just to make it clear, you have a quantum state C, you are going to make a measurement. By a measurement, we mean an orthonormal basis. And then after the measurement, you get a vector as your output, okay? That vector is one of these vectors, WKs, and the kth vector is obtained with this probability, okay? Now, these are the basic, the, these are probably the only uh, things except com complex numbers that we are going to use in the entire course. And uh, now we move to Jack for uh, describing about uh, information signals and mediums and uh, basic idea of uh, coherent states. Jack, please. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, give me just one second to switch over to my screen. Great, we should be uh, able to see my screen right now. Uh, hopefully that is the case. Uh, let me just get my laser pointer active here. Uh, yeah, there we go, cool. Um, so um, as Tiju said, uh, what we previously talked about was a lot of the introduction to the background of this course, some of the things that will be necessary. Um, I'm gonna take a step back and kind of go through some motivation first for why this is a topic that you should be interested in. Um, and so we'll start out with the discussion uh, first on information signals and mediums in general. So uh, as we all know, information is something that's all around us. We interact with it all the time. Um, it can be embedded into pretty much anything, any physical media that's around us. Uh, and it can be computed or transmitted uh, and also stored. So in this course, we're mostly interested in the transmission. Uh, we, we care about optimizing the transmission. So uh, when we think about that, we want to choose uh, between immediate, we want to choose a media that's going to be really good for that transmission. So um, some things that we can easily think of, uh, radio waves, uh, which we all know, uh, sound waves, just like when we're communicating aloud, like I am right now, carry information, uh, light waves, which are also radio waves, but when we're considering the light in the optical regime, we're considering uh, a different uh, spectrum that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and you can even think about things like DNA uh, as transmitting information over time. Um, what we really want when we're trying to send information uh, is something that we can control really well, something that can move very fast through an environment uh, that's predictable and that we can understand that and analyze that. Um, and also energy efficiency. Uh, this is becoming increasingly important as the amount of data that we're transmitting becomes exponentially higher. Uh, we don't wanna have exponentially scaling energy costs. So we try to find uh, mediums where in every way, shape, and form, we can reduce the energy cost to transmit the same amount of information. So um, just to kind of give us an idea, you know, radio towers, something very, very common that we see all around us today for things like cell phones uh, and still television broadcasts, um, but optical, uh, the light that we see that's around the, the wavelength that our eyes can register and just, uh, just longer than that um, has slightly different properties and we can control it in different ways. So we're going to be focusing a lot on that. So um, a reminder, though, that radio waves have historically been the main platform for communication. So uh, going back to the early 20th century, even radio has been around and has really transformed our world. Everything today um, from uh, iPhones to the Mars rover, uh, they communicate via radio waves that are all roughly um, in the spectrum of one millimeter or longer, sometimes up to a few meters in length. So. These, these waves are basically transparent or the material around them is transparent at this wavelength. So they can easily pass through buildings and uh, pass through uh, humans and everything else around us. So it's really great because we can set up a tower and send out information to uh, all of our surroundings quite easily. Um, they're also able to be generated and read with electronics, which means we can do it really quickly. Um, so, and we can build, you know, integrated circuits that allow us to mass produce devices that can go ahead and transmit uh, and receive this information. Also, it travels at the speed of light, so we can't go any faster than that. So we've mostly hit all of the criteria here. In fact, we have, I would say, where we're using relatively low energy, uh, we're able to go quickly, we're able to control it effectively, and we know the properties of it quite well. Um, however, uh, modern systems are increasingly moving towards using optical waves, and this is a wavelength that's much smaller. Uh, we're talking about a scale of approximately 1.5 microns, for a wavelength, this is the standard uh, telecommunications band. Um, this wavelength uh, is really great because it has very low absorption uh, in the Earth's atmosphere and in most optical materials. 
So uh, it's ideal for that purpose. We're also able to generate this pretty effectively uh, using a various, several different types of lasers, including laser diodes, which can be mass produced um, and they can be produced in a very small form factor and use very, very little power. On top of all that, because we're operating at a smaller wavelength, uh, we're also able to uh, encode more information into a given amount of time. So you can imagine that uh, if our wavelengths are a thousand times smaller, say, than a typical uh, uh, radio wave, we might be able to get up to a thousand times more information in there in the same amount of time. So uh, today, the optical fibers that we use for the internet, they're all over the world. They're increasingly being deployed uh, to homes instead of just in businesses and large scale infrastructure. Um, and we'll continue to see that trend growing. So all of that is operating at the 1.5 micron uh, wavelength. Um, in addition, uh, the recently launched Psyche mission from NASA, which is a deep space mission, it is so far the furthest uh, optical communications mission in space. Uh, and it's on its way to the Psyche uh, planetary body, this metal planetary body, and it will continue to push the limits of optical communications uh, for years to come on its way out there. So this is all to motivate um, the question of how can we best control this light? How can we get the most information out of optical wavelengths? Because the technology fundamentally and the tools that we're using to receive it are different than the ones that we've used for over 100 years with radio communications. So let's dig in a little bit more into the properties of the light we're going to be looking at. Um, in this course, we're going to be making a few simplifications to help us understand the problems. Um, so as a reminder, uh, light optical wavelengths uh, that we see are oscillating uh, waves of electronic and magnetic fields. In this course, we are going to be considering basically the electronic properties of the wave only. Um, it's We can always get back to the magnetic fields uh, through Maxwell's equations, but it's sufficient to describe the light using only the electronic field. And so um, if we imagine that our light wave looks like this, so we have the electronic field uh, pushing up in the X direction and then the magnetic field in the Y direction propagating in Z. Um, in general, we can describe uh, this, elect this electric field as uh, something that's taking up space. So it's in a specific location at R and it also is propagating in time. So it's moving in space and time. Um, we can we can characterize it by its wavelength, or in this case, its angular frequency, omega naught, which tells us how fast it's it's moving, or rather how fast it's oscillating in time. Um, this is also correlated with that 1.5 microns I was talking about. So we will pretty much be just considering uh, monochromatic light here. So we're just considering a single wavelength that we're operating with. Um, now, when you have a plane wave, which is the most simple type of wave, uh, with a definite polarization, like the wave shown here, a spatial profile, where here it's defined in a specific coordinate, and also a temporal profile uh, like this, we can actually uh, separate out the spatial and temporal components, uh, which is nice. So we'll now consider really what we're going to be talking about for most of this course is this uh, temporal profile. So below here, we have a depiction now of just the temporal profile of the light. So going over some set time period from zero to T with a given amplitude E. And also we can choose this uh, this phase offset. So again, we're considering a specific frequency of light here. Um, we are now saying that in this time profile, we can imagine that although we know the frequency, we can shift the phase uh, as we choose. So this is what we will now consider to be a square pulse. Um, so we know the phase, uh, we know the amplitude, and we'll be considering that moving forward. Um, so now we're going to go into a representation of uh, light that it will be useful in the rest of the course. It's a simplification, but it also gives us some really deep insight as to what's going on. So uh, this is called the phase space representation. Some of you may have seen this before. Um, if not, it's a really great way to kind of visualize what's happening with this light. So um, we'll start by looking over here at this diagram. Uh, first to familiarize ourselves with the axes we're talking about. So along uh, the X, we have the real axis and along the Y is the imaginary axis. Um, and so this is representing the amplitude and phase of a given pulse of light that we're considering. Uh, we will describe uh, again, a square pulse. So we're simplifying it to say it's over zero to T and it has this amplitude E. Um, and now from the profile that we have before the temporal profile, uh, we're gonna consider a rate of uh, energy that's passing through it or the amount of uh, energy incident at a given time. 
uh, as the modulus squared of the uh, temporal signal. So uh, this lambda is our rate and we're using a square pulse. So it's gonna be uniform throughout time. Um, and we'll consider that uh, that's the amplitude squared of this, this real E value here. Uh, now, another important value that we're gonna consider here is the uh, mean photon number. So then this is the number of photons on average that are present in this signal as it's passing through. So this is not a definite number of photons. We're not sending one, two, three, four photons. Uh, we're sending a pulse of light that is a defined energy, but the amount of photons that are in there um, is just an average. Uh, when you detect it, you won't necessarily get exactly that value, and we'll see that pop up in a little bit. Um, so anyways, this is the mean photon number N. Um, and so this value will be useful when we're characterizing uh, how strong of light uh, we're receiving or sending. Uh, another way to characterize it that you might have already seen is this complex amplitude alpha. So this tells us both then the uh, real amplitude, but also the phase of the light that we're considering relative to some uh, standard oscillator frequency. And so uh, alpha, the complex amplitude, which describes the light, uh, is equal to the square root of the mean photon numbers, and then it has some additional phase factor that makes it complex. So we'll mostly be characterizing uh, all of the light that we work with in a quantum state called a coherent state, which is just a complex number alpha. Um, this value uh, we'll be using different ones throughout the course. So as an example down here, uh, we're considering two different states of light. Uh, one, which is the purely uh, square pulse alpha with a given complex number that we're just going to consider to be real. Uh, and then in addition, we'll consider one that's shifted by a phase factor of pi. So it's just the same light uh, shifted. Um, so if we look at it visually, we can see that these might be a good representation of the electric field uh, for the two different states, alpha at the top and minus alpha at the bottom. So uh, we can now visualize where our light is. And this is representative of a normal laser light pulse. Uh, and we can characterize it uh, by either a complex value alpha or a mean photon number n. So we will see uh, in a little bit how to visualize this better. Um, and also we'll be plotting it uh, and showing the visuals in some code in a little bit here. So um, with that, I'm going to start a poll question here. So I want to give some get some intuition from you guys on to uh, the different energy levels here. So I'm going to ask, which of the following coherent states has the highest mean photon number? or the most energy. Uh, three different ways to consider it with a mean photon number, a complex value alpha, or given the temporal signal S of T and some unit norm time. So uh, let me try to trigger the poll here. Okay, so we're starting to see uh, a lot of consensus around A and D. Um, I will tell you that one of those is the right answer. Um, so if that helps you decide and Let's see. All right, we've got about 60% participation here. So, uh, oh yeah, we're, we're still going up. I'll wait another minute and see if uh, we can get close to 100 here. Okay, 75%, that's pretty good. Okay, um, in the winner, uh, actually, let me see, can I share these results? Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah so the winner uh, here is D and D is the correct answer. So um, there we go, uh, share results. Um, so yeah, D is the right answer because uh, the complex amplitude uh, contains this factor of two here, uh, which when we take the mod squared will certainly be larger than uh, four or larger than three. So uh, yeah, that's the right answer here. So good job, uh, everyone. You guys are picking up all of this very quickly. Okay, um, let's see, onwards, cool. So now that we kind of know uh, what we're talking about here, we're talking about states of uh, laser light pulses that are described by coherent states. And we can consider these square pulses where we have a constant amplitude of light uh, moving through time. Now, what we want to do fundamentally is we want to embed information into that light. So there's two general strategies of how we can do that. We can consider analog modulation where we're taking some uh, real signal that uh, is happening over time. We want to embed that onto the optical field itself. So um, this is something that has been around for a long time. This is uh, amplitude modulation or frequency modulation, uh, which are just embedding that signal right into the optical field uh, or the radio field too. This is actually just how AM and FM radio work uh, in your car. Um, so we can either change the amplitude to match the signal, 
or we can change the frequency uh, slightly uh, to match the signal as well. Um, this is really good if you want to just send, you know, voice um, or some audio uh, in a really efficient manner. So that's why radio is really good for this. Um, however, this is not really useful for trying to send uh, really large data sets. And in fact, digital modulation is what we use pretty much all the time now, um, especially in optical signals. So um, digital modulation is actually, instead of betting uh, continuous signal, we're going to embed uh, discrete uh, binary symbols over time. So we can still imagine that we have our light, which is propagating over time. And just like above here, we have a constant amplitude field. Um, and so we are, or I should say a constant intensity field um, over time. And we want to embed into that uh, a set of zero and one. So we have a lot of different options to how to do this. Um, but we imagine that we have some physical modulator that's acting on the incoming signal light. Uh, and then when the light passes through, uh, we can have some change in it. So uh, a really common technique is called on-off keying, which we will see again in more detail later. Um, but in this case, it's as simple as it sounds. So uh, on-off keying, you turn keep the signal on if you want to send a one, or turn the signal off, uh, turn the intensity to zero if you want to send a zero. Um, some variations of this include only doing it um, with uh, half the time, so that way you are always returning to zero. Uh, to minimize the amount of energy that you're sending, which remember earlier, I said that's a really key task, especially um, for space-based systems. Um, you also, instead of using uh, intensity modulation here, uh, you could imagine using some sort of phase shifting uh, or frequency shifting, just like we did with the analog signal. So um, phase shift keying uh, here, this the frequency shift keying is, is not as common uh, with the optical signals, um, but phase shift keying, PSK, uh, is much more common, and it's something that we will be seeing for the rest of this course. So uh, the key here is that the same field is coming in with the same optical intensity. Um, instead of turning it off and on, we're just changing the phase during each of our time periods, and we want to be able to read that out to determine if a zero or one was sent. So uh, we're going to go now a little bit more into the modulation techniques that are available. Um, so on-off keying, as I said before, is really just sending either the signal that uh, is present all the time and just letting it pass through uh, unimpeded or off being uh, dampen it down to zero intensity. So if we look at the mean photon number of these two possible states, uh, we either have uh, mod alpha squared or we have a value of zero. So uh, if we're doing direct detection on this, we know that we should get some signal detection from uh, this alpha squared and we should get no detection from this in an ideal system. Now, you can imagine that um, if I want to send uh, some value, let's say I want to send like a score of a game, I want to send like a specific value of a pixel, um, it's not going to be zero or one. It's going to be some uh, some integer value that's greater than that. So in the case of on-off keying, I could send a series of them, the binary sequence that corresponds to that, um, that uh, higher integer. Um, one issue, though, is that if I do that, at each time step, I have a possibility of error of mischaracterizing which of my signals was sent. So let's say I want to send a value of uh, 16. So I need to send uh, four bits. Then in each of those time periods, I have a possibility of mischaracterizing my signal. Um, an alternative to that would be to send what's called pulse position modulation, where instead of having uh, each time be on or off, I now choose some integer value that I'm trying to send. Uh, in this case, it's M and I only send the signal in the nth slot of that. So if I had 20, uh, if I was gonna allow myself to send a signal of up to 20, um, and I wanted to send a value of say 16, in this case, I would send all of my light, all of my signal in that one time period. Um, this is nice because I don't have to use energy most of the time. However, I really need to optimize a really high peak power. Uh, so my laser isn't actually working most of the time. It's just kind of sitting there idle or it's actually on, but I'm forcing it to go down to zero using some modulator after. So it's kind of a waste of power in that sense. But what's really nice about this is that I really only need to get my correct detection this one time for it to be accurate. So um, pulse position modulation is very common in deep space communications um, because as we propagate the signal over a long period, we lose a lot of our signal. Um, and so you can imagine that if I start out with some power that's really high, over time, it's going to drop down to a low value. And so I'll have less of a chance of detecting it, but still some availability. And all I need to do is detect that one to be able to decode uh, a larger integer value. 
So these are all, those are all intensity uh, modulation techniques. Um, the other one that we talked about is phase, uh, phase modulation. So phase shift keying is the key one that we're going to talk about here. Um, binary phase shift keying is something that I already showed you guys uh, a little bit earlier, where we have uh, two different coherent states that have equal amplitude, but are shifted by pi phase. So again, uh, we see over here the two states. Um, either way, we get the same amount of energy present in the pulse because they're the same length, uh, the same amplitude, but they have a different phase. So um, we can't distinguish between the two of these using just a counting of how many photons are present. We'll have to come up with some other ways to decode this in a little bit. Um, this is really common um, in a lot of uh, systems, both in fiber and in free space. Um, so that's, that's really good. Um, and also you can imagine that we're able to really fully utilize our laser power the whole time. We don't have to waste any of it and we don't need really high peak power. We can just keep one constant CW source going. Um, and just change the phase each time. Uh, you can imagine a more complex version of this where instead of just choosing uh, two different values in phase, uh, we could choose to add in uh, any number of separate phases along the way. So if we choose to operate at some given amplitude for our CW source, but we want to encode uh, Q different signals into that, uh, we can shift the phase instead of by pi, but by two pi divided by Q. Um, and so that would be what we call Q array phase shift keying. Uh, this is also really common in fiber systems, um, but an even more advanced version of this would be to not limit ourselves to just changing the phase, but instead allowing ourselves to change both the phase and the amplitude of the signal. So uh, this is called quadrature amplitude modulation. Um, and we can say that for M different signals that we're encoding in each time bin, we have M uh, QAM as our modulation technique. So. Of all of them, this uh, is probably the most common um, in, in fiber systems today uh, because you're able to embed so much information into a single time period. Um, however, uh, this requires both the detection of the phase and the amplitude. So you're gonna need some technique to decode between all of that. Um, and also this needs to be a really strong system that is not very lossy because as you uh, lose amplitude, uh, there's a lot of chance of making these signals so so close together that they're effectively uh, not able to be discriminated. So um, if you have like a fiber-based system with a really strong laser, uh, this would be the type of modulation scheme that you would probably want to be using. Um, and a quick note on how we actually do this modulation, because up to now I've just said that we have some arbitrary modulator. Um, well, that's uh, in general going to be something that's called a Mach Zender type, Mach Zender interferometer. Um, so these are actually really common in the internet infrastructure today. Um, usually they're made out of a material, material called lithium niobate. Um, so these are integrated nanophotonic systems that are coupled with fiber. So I have some optical signal that comes in on my fiber. Uh, it's coupled into this nanophotonic chip. And then by applying a voltage from a classical like CMOS chip, um, I'm able to then change the output data uh, coming out the fiber at the other side. So um, depending on if you want to do amplitude modulation or phase modulation or both, and how quickly you want to do it, uh, these can become uh, pretty expensive. So, um, but they are commercially available. So this is a 10 gigabit per second uh, optical intensity modulator. So this one is only doing intensity. So it would be doing something like this where we're doing on off keying, um, but uh, to turn them into uh, both amplitude and phase modulation, uh, you need to have a more advanced system so they can range up into the uh, tens of thousands of dollars, depending on what you're looking for. But this is the this is fundamentally the technology that allows us to work with optical signals so easily is that these can be mass produced um, and they're able to change both phase and amplitude. So um, to kind of wrap up uh, this section on modulation for coherent states of laser light pulse, uh, I'm going to give you guys a little question here. Uh, which of the following modulation formats is most challenging to generate? And I'll give you a hint that uh, amplitude is relatively easy to modulate on its own. Phase is slightly more difficult to modulate on its own. Um, and modulating both simultaneously is the most difficult. So while you're reading through the options, I will launch the poll here. Okay. I will end the poll there and see if I can share the results for everyone to see. So you should be able to see um, most of you got the right answer, which is B. So uh, quadrature amplitude modulation requires both uh, modulation of the phase and the amplitude. Um, and so even though there's less possible 
locations for it or less possible signals being embedded. Um, this is actually uh, much more difficult. So um, analog would probably be the, the easiest of all since it can be done relatively slowly. Um, On-off keying is just an, uh, I would say, a more difficult version of PPM, uh, whereas you have to change it every time. PPM, you only need to adjust it once, but has really, really high peak power. So excellent. Um, so yeah, you guys are two for two on getting the right answer on these polls. Okay, so um, now I want to go back to the definition of the coherent state. So, so far we've been, uh, I've been a little bit lax in how I've described it. I've just told you that it's a uh, an abstract representation of a uh, laser light pulse. And so uh, what a coherent state actually is in terms of its uh, quantum description is it's a superposition state uh, over all the photon number or FOC basis states. Um, and so for a given amplitude, uh, you're taking on a different uh, set of uh, uh, values over each of the possible FOC basis states. And so uh, if we look at this formula here, this is the same coherent state we've been talking about. Uh, and at each time, it's effectively taking on uh, an amplitude that's scaled by this uh, coherent amplitude, and it's just over each of the Bach bases. So uh, for any given amplitude alpha, we'll have some probability of it being zero photons, some probability of it being one, two, and onwards. Um, so uh, this is going to be relevant when we're talking about detection in a little bit, um, but I just wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit more detail on what we're talking about here. So. So far, the reason that we've talked about the coherent state is that it's relatively easy to generate because laser light pulses naturally uh, are described by coherent states. So, so this is easy to generate. But you might already be considering, well, um, since coherent states are non-orthogonal, um, why wouldn't I use something like photon number basis to send signals that actually are uh, perfectly able to be discriminated? So if I sent one photon versus two photons and I detect one photon, I'll know that that was my signal that was sent. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, and although it's hard to do, um, it is an interesting idea. So one could imagine uh, in the future using some sort of source like an advanced quantum dot uh, that's able to generate a specific number of photons at the target frequency. So instead of using a laser, uh, we could use a quantum dot or potentially other sources of single photons or n photons. Um, I choose to send some modulation of n photons, in this case, three. And then at the end, I have some photon number resolving detectors. So this tells me exactly how many were sent. Um, today, this isn't feasible. Um, the photon sources that we have are either uh, probabilistic, and so we can't guarantee that it will generate the right number, or they don't send uh, perfectly, uh, perfectly equivalent photons each time. So slight changes in the wavelength or uh, other phenomena. So we can't really count on this yet, but it could be an interesting way in the future to send uh, more information and in high energy systems. Um, uh, so it's it's a similar intensity modulation, although it's not on off keying. Um, but uh, I also wanted to show you guys a little bit of uh, something that I find interesting, which is in the same way that the phase space representation of the coherent state looked like a small circle on a 2D space, um, we can actually look at individual photons in that same space. Um, and so one photon represented in phase space uh, has a profile that's uh, Circularly symmetric, uh, taking on Laguerre, uh, Laguerre polynomials, actually. But um, in this case, just to give you a sense of uh, how it looks, um, instead of plotting in 2D, I'm just doing a, a surf map of it. So that way we can see the uh, positive components and the negative components of it, too. So, um, or the, the amplitudes of it. So one photon looks like this. Uh, it has, you can consider just like one ring, two photons. Uh, we'll have two rings, the first one being now. A negative value and the second one being a positive value, uh, three photons, the trend continues, and you can imagine this going on and on. So um, that's going to wrap it up for uh, the intro to the modulation uh, in the laser light itself. So we're going to try something uh, a little different here now, um, and I'm going to uh, have you guys join me in trying to uh, plot some of this on your own and look at it in Jupiter. So um, the steps are going to be to go to uh, Colab, uh, open up a uh, GitHub repository that I put up a file on already, and we'll just be running that. So um, I'm going to post the link um, in the chat for this, because what you'll have to do is go to GitHub uh, or select select GitHub as the source, and then you have to type this in. And I'm going to walk through all these steps in a second, um, but I'm going to go ahead and post this link uh, for now. So let me pause my sharing. 
Okay, so I just posted the link um, and now I'm going to uh, switch over to uh, Colab and I will uh, share my screen. Give me one second again. Okay, so now um, you guys should be seeing uh, my browser. So I am at uh, Colab and actually, sorry, let me go back to the homepage, colab.google. So you'll start here. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to hit uh, open collab. Once you're here, uh, click the GitHub tab at the uh, left side here, and then uh, paste in. Uh, mine didn't paste for some reason. So. Sorry, let me just preview this. Go back home. Search. Search. Sorry, I'm not sure why my copy paste isn't working. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. Hopefully, the copy pasting is just an issue for me. Um, but otherwise, yeah, type in uh, HTTPS uh, colon backslash backslash github.com slash my name, Jack Postalweight, and then winter school. And then what you should see um, is this info in Photon Examples, iPy Notebook. Um, and you can just click right on that, and it should open up a new notebook that uh, has all the code in here already. So um, there's two main sections, and then there's an opening cell to just install the notebooks or the, sorry, the relevant packages. Um, so run that right away because we're going to need to install um, SciPy and also Strawberry Fields, which is a uh, photonics package from uh, Xanadu, which is a photonic quantum computing company. So this is going to be the tool that we're going to use for the most part to simplify our examples here. Um, and it's really fun to use if you guys are also interested in exploring more about this. So um, hopefully it's quick. I think it takes maybe like 20 seconds or 30 to install the packages. So um, while that is going on for me, I'm going to pause my screen and see if people are having any troubles in the chat here. Okay, I've seen a bunch of comments and questions, but I think we're mostly... Getting people there, so cool. Um, hopefully, um, everyone's able to get this running. If not, uh, you can just follow along for me with me for now. Um, so we've installed all the packages, um, and now we're going to go on to section one here. So we're going to start with something simple, um, which is just going to be modeling uh, Poisson point process and just starting to see um, how we would uh, look at the the possible outputs from that or what the distribution should be. Um, so I just changed <clears throat> my sample value to lower it. Um, you can keep it as it is; it'll give you more. Uh, values, but since I have a mean value of one right now, we only need a few samples. So uh, Poisson distribution normally looks something like this, where we take on uh, discrete values uh, with this with the uh, highest amplitude being centered at the mean value of our Poisson. So with a Poisson value of mean of one, uh, I'm just generating random samples uh, and then plotting them. So uh, as Tiju said earlier, though, we would expect that this should approach a Gaussian as we increase our values. So let's uh, increase our mean value uh, to 100 and run it again. And already we can start to see the Gaussian profile is, is pretty well defined. Um, I think this is just an error from my binning uh, that it's giving us these gaps in between, but you can definitely see the profile of the Gaussian. Uh, hey, Jack, um, your screen, it looks like it's still paused. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> apologies, apologies. Okay. Um, all right, everyone, I'll go back up to the top. So uh, Jack, uh, uh, comment. Uh, yes. Many things. Uh, one piece, some of them were not able to copy it from the chat. Uh, I think the Zoom is not allowing to copy that G GitHub from the I chat. See. Okay, I have already answered in one of the questions, and it is there in the Q and A. So people should be able to copy it from there. Secondly, yep. a common question is how to install. Okay, so I just answered that there is no installation. Maybe you can just say that to run this. Yeah, course. sorry. What I what I meant to say was that this first cell, and you guys, sorry, you couldn't see my screen before, so this will hopefully help. Um. The very first cell when you open this, it's calling to install these libraries in Collab. So this is not running locally on your computer. Um, this is, well, it's, I mean, it is, but it's also uh, pulling from a server from Google. So um, these two lines right here are just gonna be uh, pip install uh, where it's telling it to run the install in the cell itself right here. So um, that's what I meant by install. You don't have to actually do anything lo like locally on your computer. Um, just go to this website and then run this first cell as it's listed already. Um, yeah, I can go back in a minute to how we uh, um, actually get set up here. But the one thing I was just talking about was that 
Um, I'll run this again. So the second cell um, is just plotting uh, Poisson distribution. Um, so we see that the histogramming here, we see the value where the maximum uh, amplitude is, is going to be one, and we chose a mean value of one, so that makes sense. Uh, but then as we increase this mean value to 100, uh, we see this Gaussian profile. So this is what I was talking about. Um, and let me actually go back and just um, show again how we did this. So I hit open collab. I guess you guys weren't able to see any of this. So yeah, I hit open collab from the top, and then I clicked GitHub, and then did HTTPS colon github.com slash my name, Jack Postlewaite, P-O-S-T-L-E-W-A-I-T-E. Um, and then uh, Winter School, uh, capital them both. So I'll leave that there for a second. But if you type that uh, and then hit the little um, search glass on the side, below what will pop up will be info and photon examples dot uh, ipi notebook. And then you can just click right on that. So I'll leave this up on the screen for a second. And again, check the chat because I guess I wasn't uh, doing that properly. Um, so I'll assume everyone's got that right now, but um, again, you can follow along with me. So um, once you're in here, run the first cell, uh, that'll just run and install things. And then uh, the second cell is all about showing how you can get a Poisson process that approaches a Gaussian as you increase uh, the mean value. So feel free to play around with that, change the mean value, uh, change the number of bins or the number of samples if you want it to run faster. Um, Next, we are going to, uh, I think actually because we took took up so much time missing it here, I think um, we can continue on um, down to, uh, it's going to be a little further down actually, sorry about that. But, um, oh, um, so there's a cell that says, let's plot the coherent states in phase space. Um, so we're going to hop down to that one. Um, so what this cell is going to do is it's going to use strawberry fields, which is, is again, a photonics program um, that's used to model photonic systems. And you can do a lot with it, way more than we're going to do today. Um, but we're going to start out by just saying that uh, we want to consider two different uh, states. So we have this SF.program2. So this is going to give us two states. Um, strawberry fields has different ways that you can um, run the program, some of which are more or less um, computationally efficient. In our case, we're going to use the Gaussian backend. Um, so it's actually representing these states, um, not using their Fock representation, but uh, with a Gaussian representation, which is sufficient for coherent states. Uh, we're going, at this point, you can then define uh, your alpha. So this is up to you. You can put whatever value you want in here. I just chose one. Um, so you can decide what amplitude you want. You can make this a complex number if you want to. Um, but I have it just being real for now. Um, then the program will go ahead and it will generate the circuit. Um, it will place a coherent state with amplitude alpha into the zeroth mode and one with uh, minus alpha, so the pi phase shifted one into the first mode. And then it will run the circuit to analyze what's happening. And then the rest of the code down below here is just for visualization purposes. Um, so what we're actually looking at is called the Wigner function. Um, and so I don't know. There we go. Um, so yeah, this first one here is showing the phase space plot as we looked at it before, um, or visualizing it another way um, in kind of this this uh, 3D mesh plotting here. Um, this is the same uh, coherent state, but without the axes. And now uh, this would then be the minus alpha coherent state. So you can see that they're uh, just shifted, but they do have uh, what would be some overlap uh, probably near the zero point. And the last thing we're going to talk about in this section then um, is visualizing the Fox state. So that was the one of the last slides that I just showed you guys. Um, so this next cell down below um, will just give us all the ability to do that. So uh, we're going to define a function where I tell it how many photons I want to visualize. Um, we're only going to use one mode at a time here. Um, we're going to use the other backend, which is the Fox backend. So we can't represent a single photon in the Gaussian representation. Um, None of this is super important. I'm just kind of giving you guys some insight as to what's going on here. Um, and then after that, um, we're just going to say generate this Fox state with the given value in the zeroth mode. And then we're again going to plot the Wigner functions. So the cell right below that um, will be one that shows the 
2D version and then the 3D version. And in this case, I have four photons in here. So um, yeah, so this is a little tool set that we're gonna start using here um, for the rest of this course. And now uh, hopefully you guys have a little bit of a, an ability to play around with and help yourselves visualize different uh, amplitudes and different uh, uh, states. So um, I think we'll probably end it here for now. We will be returning to this a little bit later. Um, so if you have it up, you can keep it open in the background, don't close it. Um, but I am going to uh, switch back over uh, to teach you now, actually. So um, this will be the end of my section. We'll come back later and look at this more. So teach you feel free to uh, take over. Sure, sure. Thank you, Jack. That was a beautiful session. And the quotes, uh, the visualization were really nice. Um, okay, let's proceed now. Let me share my screen. Okay. Um, can you see my... Can, Jack, can you stop your sharing? Yeah, I can stop now. Yeah. Now it should be... Up. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, there was something which I missed here. Uh, we continue with some theory. Now, there are something which I missed here is this, uh, and it came up in a chat. Thanks for that. This PK is a positive number here, but here it's not exactly PK, but it's going to be this number, okay? Whatever is inside the modular square, that is the omega WK times C. When you expand a state vector C in a basis, these are the numbers, complex numbers, which come. It's not PK. That's a typo. Okay, good. So let's move. So we finished this part. Okay, good. So now we have seen that we can we can use uh, coherent states. So we are going to now specialize to coherent states as, and uh, uh, we'll deal with basically two different uh, uh, modulation formats one is on off keying and one is bpsk we will discuss all those th things now let's go to a detection format for a coherent state and this is called the ideal direct detection of a square pulse okay a square pulse is a coherent state and uh, this is this is what we have seen majorly in jack's um, session and then you want to do so once we encode some information into light okay let's say and then we want to retrieve the information so once we send out this light how to retri retrieve this information so one way is to detect the number of photons in that okay and then make a guess which side to which light pulse was sent so this thing let's call let's think that uh, we have a photo a photon detector in our lab and uh, so this light comes through and this detector what it does is it just counts the number of photons okay so at some we have a time period zero to t at some point random point in between you get a pulse and then at some other point we get another pulse and when you run the experiment for this t amount of seconds t seconds uh, we get certain number of clicks okay so this click pattern this now we have already seen the uh, coherent state representation. Now, if you, you should think of it as counting as mathematically, it's an orthonormal basis. So we, we, as we discussed earlier, the measurement mis means an orthonormal basis. That means if you have this coherent state coming in, there are certain probability with which you will get K clicks here. You know, you get you may get only one click over this time period. You may get 10 clicks, you may get 100 clicks, whatever. So that click pattern follows a probability distribution. And in the case of coherent states, what happens is that this, uh, this probability distribution, okay, the number of clicks at uh, arrival of number of clicks in this time period, okay, that follows a Poisson distribution. And um, we'll see in a bit uh, again the, uh, with the definition of coherent state, but for now it is a Poisson distribution with the mean photon number n as its uh, parameter or in other ways the mean and lambda of this person uh, mean and variance of this person distribution is n which is the mean photon number inside this pulse okay so uh, one one takeaway is that this measurement mechanism which we call as ideal direct detection of a square pulse square pulse is this one this uh, now for photon counting process is called ideal direct detection and uh, here, the mathematical orthonormal basis which plays a role here is the photon number basis or the FOC basis which we uh, saw previously. And the uh, statistics, the measurement statistics is the K number of photons are measured here with the probability e to the power minus n, n to the power k divided by k factorial. 
So, and then uh, we don't derive this fact. You can take it as an experimental fact, uh, this one. But from our definition of the coherent state, these things are clear because as Jack had mentioned earlier, this is the, you know, uh, definition of a coherent state. And this is the, you know, as if you take a, uh, take the absolute value square of this number, those are the probabilities, right? We had seen that when you have a measurement, our measurement basis is this one. And uh, you have these are the absolute value square of these numbers are the probabilities. And uh, these n vectors are the Fock uh, for basis vectors. And uh, then we have this thing, probability of getting k photons. When you are sending the state alpha and detecting use, using an ideal photon detector, and the k, k photons are obtained with this probability, okay? That is what the absolute value square of these numbers. And uh, the mean photon number, in other words, from here also we can derive the mean photon number. Yeah. There are different ways of doing things, but it's all depend on where you start from. If you just start from this definition and uh, the coherent, uh, the Fock basis, then the mean photon number can be just derived like, you know, the, your, your random variable is this thing a number of photons number of for k capital k the number of photons and the summation k with the probability with which you get k photons that number is your mean photon number if you just do a small calculation we will see that mod alpha square if you send if you have alpha as your coherent state mod alpha square is your mean photon number all right now let's move to a a detection mechanism with a on off keying modulation okay so we know now for the coherent states, this is the mean photon number and how to detect it using the grid detection. Now we convert that to a receiver. Okay, let's see. All right. So we have two states of light. Let's say this is vacuum. There's no light. We are dampening it completely and alpha. So we are going to use the zero and alpha uh, to could two states uh, as our modulation format. That means let's you can imagine like if you want to send one zero a bunch of ones and zeros instead of ones i will send alpha instead of zeros i will send the ket zero um, just like jack has men had mentioned uh, the modulation formats like dampening zero means you don't send a light here you send the light alpha all right and then once you make the detection you need a decision rule okay once you make the detection what you get you get some clicks right once you make a direct detection here uh where if it is a zero if there is no light, there is no detection. There, you don't detect anything, okay? And if there is an alpha, there is a probability with which you get some, uh, you know, number of clicks. So after getting these clicks, suppose let's uh, let's say, uh, let's say that you get k clicks, okay? And then you want to decide from the clicks, click pattern, okay? You got you run the experiment once, let's say, and you got a certain number of clicks. Let's say ten clicks were received, and then you want to decide whether you got, uh, you know zero or alpha so a good decision rule here is a called um, the this uh, maximum likelihood decision rule so just say so since we already know the prior information is that uh, either zero or alpha is going to be sent if there is no click it's very likely that it's it will be h1 they just uh, decide the your rule that it's very likely to be h1 and for uh, greater than zero if you get a click you decide that you are uh, what is sent is H2, that H2 is this alpha. So this is our decision rule, okay? And here we also know one more thing that the prior probability with which these things arrive is half, okay? That is a prior probability. Before the before we run the experiment itself, we know that zeros and alphas are, you know, every time you want to send a signal, you just cost, cost it, toss a coin and uh, send uh, zero or alpha according to the, you know, be, let's say being head or tail, sure. And then this, this is an important concept for us. The measurement basis remains the same as the photon number basis. We have a measurement basis and then we have a decision rule. These two things together is called a receiver. Okay. So we have some signals coming in. We do some measurement that mathematically that measurement is a orthonormal basis for us. And then you decide getting the results of the measurement, you decide which, uh, signal was sent to you and this process is called a uh, this thing the uh, this mechanism is called a receiver all right now let's now obviously there are going to be some error can you see that uh, in from the previous slide we can see that okay when we uh, do a direct detection okay when we do a direct detection we know that this is the probability with which you get k photons right so let's say you were sending 
some uh, wave alpha, some coherent state alpha with mean photon number, let's say 10. Okay. That means this n is 10. Now, do we have a non zero probability for getting zero photons? So, a zero photons here, that is k is equal to zero, little k is equal to zero. You don't receive any photon. You, you send a uh, coherent state alpha with mean photon number uh, 10. And then what is the probability with which you get zero uh, photons here? Zero clicks. A zero click is obtained by putting k is equal to zero here. If you put k is equal to zero, and uh, we have a certain n here that is 10 for our case, e to the power minus 10 times n to the power zero, that is 10 to the power zero, divided by zero factorial. That is e to the power minus 10, right? If So whatever be the mean photon number here, there is a probability, there is a non-zero probability, which is e to the power minus n, okay? with which you don't receive a click. So they, they are, so obviously your decision rule is going to give you some error. So now look back here. Our decision rule is that if you get no click, you just decide that, you know, uh, zero is what you obtained. So that means you are, you, are sub, you may make a mistake. Even when the alpha is sent, there is a non-zero probability with which uh, you may not get a click. But that in that case, we'll make, be making a mistake. Now, we want to understand how much mistake we can we take and then we want to adjust our system so that we reduce our uh, error, probability of error. So let's compute the probability of error now, okay? In this system, this is a you know classic example of a hypothesis testing this system and our probability of error, this variation probability of error, the formula for that is you are you are given H1, so when, you, when do you make mistake? Okay, this is a formula, okay? And I, I am just trying to explain that formula, probability of error. When do you make a problem? There are two ways to make an error here, isn't it? You were given H1, but at after your measurement and decision rule, you decided that H2 was given. That's one way to make a mistake. And another way to make a mistake is you were given H2, but you decide at the end that, uh, you know, H1 was given. So these are the two ways you make an error. And the average of these two errors is called the probability of error. So this is a definition for now, and uh, we, we can compute this probability. Of error. Our aim in general is to minimize this probability of error. Okay, so in this system, but let's see what is the probability of error. Oh, now we have a probability of H1. So we assumed an equal prior here. It can be an a P and one minus P also it doesn't matter for us right now. It is just half. Both are both H1 and H2 are two hypotheses with equal priors, and uh, therefore probability of H1 is half. And then this has to be multiplied by probability of H2 given H1. Okay. So when do you decide it is H2 when you are given H1? Okay. So when you are given H1 means what? The light, the, there is no light. Zero is sent. The state zero, catch zero is sent. There is no light coming through. But you got some click, right? And that is the way, that is when, if, if you get a click only, then you will say that it is H2 was received. That is our decision rule is that when you get a click, you say that uh, H2 was sent. So you have been presented with the coherent state zero and that's no light, but you made a decision that, you know, H2 was given. That happens if you get a click. This is the probability of H2 given H1. Similarly, if you're given, presented with H1, H2 already, okay, some of you, this is the sent signal, but at the end, you got no click, okay? And that is when you decide it was H1. So that is, that, uh, that is H1 is decided when H2 was already given to you. So that happens when K is equal to zero, okay? You don't get a uh, click even when this coherent state alpha was given to you. So this is a, uh, another way of making an error. So this average is what the probability of error. Now let's uh, do a, do two polls. We will see what is this number and this number, okay? Jack, uh, is it possible for you to load the poll question? Uh, yeah, hold on. Give me one second here. All right. Um, yeah, we have the poll question here. And uh, all the information is here, whatever we explained. Probability of K greater than zero when H1 is given. That is the question. Okay, so H1 means there is no light going, going in. And uh, you know that probability of obtaining K clicks in any case. So... Uh, what should be this number? So we let's take a few minutes, one minute to answer this thing. Okay, uh, we're at a minute. It looks like uh, C has slightly favored uh, at the very end here, so we come out on top, but A is also just behind it. So I'm going to end the poll, share the results. So uh, 
k greater than 0 when h1 is given. What is h1? h1 was uh, h1 was your uh, coherent state, right? Coherence state 0. Okay. If h1 is given, what is the probability that you get a click? Isn't it? Huh? That I think uh, many people didn't get it right. Actually, if zero is given, there is no probability that you will get a click, right? Hmm? So the answer, right answer here is zero. Please think about it a little bit. So the point is that n is equal to zero here, okay? The number n is equal to zero and k is a strictly positive number so that this number totally becomes zero, okay? That is the point here. Now let's go to the next poll and uh, the, the other quantity here. So pro probability k is equal to the, the next poll is... Here. Yeah, yeah, probability of k is equal to zero when h2 is given. So we're at 45 seconds here, and uh, c is a pretty dominant answer right now. So I think we'll uh, we'll close it off right here and share the results. That's good. This time, most people got it right because we, uh, we know that h2 is given, okay, and that means the mean photon number is n, and... Uh, what is the probability that uh, k is equal to 0? k is equal to 0 is uh, just put a little k is equal to 0 here and then e to the power minus n. Okay, good. All right. So uh, if you go, didn't get it right, I suggest that you go back to this once again with the slides and uh, uh, try it out. All right. Let's move on. Let's finish that computation of the probability of error. Okay, so we were here. I know that this is a little bit small, but uh, we already did this computation up to here. Okay, probability of error can be computed like this. And from the poll questions, we know now that this number is zero and that this number is one. And this number is e to the power minus n. Just put it back here and you get half of e to the power minus n. This is an important quantity for us, okay? This is the probability of error when you have on of keying and direct detection, okay, with equal probability. If you just uh, here itself, we can think something. If you had H1, P of H1 is equal to some P and P of H2 is equal to some one minus P, what happens is just one minus P appears here, okay? That's the only difference that is going to happen. So with equal prior on of keying and direct detection receiver, we get this as the probability of error. So there is a probability of error and that is this one, sure. Now let's recall where are we now. So our system, so we were thinking that we want to send this message and uh, we have a transmitter. We didn't think anything about noise. We are assuming for the time, all this discussion till now, we did not introduce the noise, okay? It's just that a uh, noiseless, lossless system uh, channel and it just goes through and in the receiving end, what we were doing was we were we started with a zero or alpha being sent instead of one and zero and one, let's say. And then at the receiving end, we had either zero or alpha coming in, and then we use a direct detection method, okay? That means we just count the number of photons and then make a maximum likelihood decision rule to decide what is our, what was sent to you, whether it was a zero or a one. Good. And this is called on of keying, and it will come again in this course. And uh, your detection method was uh, photon number basis plus um, ML decision rule, that was your receiver. And we found, we also derived the probability of error in this system. Okay, now what we are going to do is that we will discuss the minimum probability of error that is inherent in the system while detecting two general pure states, okay? So here it was a specific situation. You were sending, I, you knew that you were sending either a ket zero or a ket alpha, coherent state zero or alpha. Now, what if it was some C1 and C2, okay? So we want to understand what is the probability of error when you are sending a general 0 and 1 and using a general measurement. In here, this was a specific example where you, we used 0 or alpha and used this, this particular detection mechanism, okay? The receiver, which is photon number basis plus ML detection. Now, let's think that you have two general pure states, let's say P1 and C1 and C2, and you want to do the measurement. A general measurement is a 1 mm uh, measurement is a uh, orthonormal basis, and you want to see what is the probability of error you are going to make. And you want to minimize that probability of error, okay? So here, uh, let's say you have you are presented with two states, C1 and C2, okay? You, what we do is we just use our coordinate system in such a way that uh, it just cut here, exactly in the middle. We'll, we can adjust it. You can, you can change the basis and you can start with this 
the angling it is in this way all right this is c1 is your hypothesis one c2 is hypothesis two and a general uh you know uh, basis is an orthonormal basis of this system which we have right so what we are going to use is orthonormal two set of orthonormal vectors here let's say you have a uh, you have this vector omega w1 is equal to this vector and w2 is equal to this vector okay so you are given with just to repeat you are given with c1 and c2 which are like this which are positioned like this with the axis and then you are choosing an arbitrary basis okay omega w1 and w2 basis means they has these two vectors has to be perpendicular okay so and we can write if this angle is phi we can write this cos phi sin phi if this angle is theta we can write cos theta sin theta i'm not going to the details of that just to note just note that the the uh, the scalar product between your initial vectors c1 and c2 which we have to discriminate using our uh, orthonormal basis the scalar product we write it as sigma okay this this number is going to be important for us the scalar product between c n1 and c2 which is in this setting it will be cos 2 theta but don't mind never mind it is sigma is the number which is going to be useful for us for the last formula for the derivation this theta will be important but at the end this remembering that this is the scalar product between c1 and c2 sigma is the scalar product between c1 and c2 that is important all right then so what is our decision rule here? Okay, I'm putting this one more decision rule here. Once we do the measurement, okay, let's say we were uh, we are measuring this uh, C1 and C2 using W1 and W2, and the measurement outcome is W1. Let's say, okay, if the measurement outcome is W1, we decide. Okay, this is a decision rule we are doing. Okay, this is another maximum likelihood decision rule. It can be. Um, it need not be maximum likelihood always, but in this setting, in this picture, it is the maximum likelihood. Okay, if you get w1 as your result of the measurement you decide that c1 was given to you similarly if you get w2 as your uh, measurement outcome you decide that c2 was given to you this is your measurement uh, decision rule so a receiver means what we have a basis uh, which performs the measurement and then we have a decision rule from the outcome of the measurement what is the uh, given state so uh, this is a decision rule. W1 means we are given, we decide that it was C1 and W2 means we decide that it is C2 was given. Then probability of error is, uh, as we discussed earlier, it, it is the you know, average of the two types of mis mistakes we make, right? When you are actually given two, that means actually presented with C2, you obtain W1 as your, you know, uh, outcome that can obtain with this probability we had seen the scalar product between w1 and c2 absolute value square that can be computed as this number i'm not going to give the details these are uh, trigonometry examples actually when you are actually given with c1 that is your uh, c1 one is given to you then but measurement outcome is two okay so then also that's also another way of making an error probability of two given one is just once again this number that can be computed as sine square theta minus v okay so probability of error as we discussed earlier it is the uh just a second sure probability of error, error is p times probability of two given one plus one minus p times probability of one given two so here the prior probability we know it is p which p1 is equal to p is the probability with which c1 is presented and p2 is equal to 1 minus p is the probability with which c2 will be presented so in that case we know that the probability of error is defined like that now uh, we know this quantity we know this quantity just plug it in and we have a formula for probability of error but what we are interested in is so this was an arbitrary basis right so our um, goal is to find an optimal basis okay so if you just choose an arbitrary basis, you get a probability of error like this. But now I want to optimize. So C1 and C2, I cannot do anything. That is presented to me. Okay, that is uh, uh, presented to me before the start of the experiment. What I can do is that I can position my basis, okay, which is W1, W2. These vectors I can position in such a way that I minimize the probability of error. How to do that now? So for a general basis, we know this is a probability of error with these formula here. And uh, how to minimize the probability of error? Minimizing probability of error means that we choose a basis, W1 and W2, in such a way that we minimize this number. That means minimize this right side quantity. So what we, what should we do for that? So this, you know, we just need to differentiate this probability of error and, uh, you know, the uh, uh, 
set it to zero. So minimizing the probability of error means you just differentiate this probability of error with respect to phi. Remember that phi was our, uh, you know, angle of this measure, uh, measurement vector with our axis. Okay. So to choose the optimal measurement, that means to choose an optimal basis which minimizes this probability of error, what we just do is we differentiate with respect to that phi and put it to zero. Okay. And we do the computation. It is just a easy calculation only at, at the end. Okay. Once we do this thing and minimize the probability of error, what we see is that this will be the minimum probability of error. You can see it here that the uh, pro minimum probability of error will be achieved at half of 1 minus square root of square root of 1 minus 4 p 1 minus p sigma square. Just recall that sigma was the scalar product between the given c1 and c2. Okay, This was the prior probabilities p and 1 minus p for c1 and c2 respectively. And the minimum probability of error in this setting, Okay, measuring c1 and c2 using a basis and uh, the optimal choice of the basis will have a certain angle and then the minimum probability that that angle is this uh i i think that angle has this property okay this uh, between theta and phi this uh, this equation should be satisfied for choosing the you know uh, optimal phi and then the minimum probability of error can be computed as this number just remember that this minimum probability of error depends only on this angle between C1 and C2 and the prior probability with which you are receiving C1 and C2. So this is the minimum and uh, minimum probability of error. And if you put P is equal to half here, that is your equal prior. Equal prior means your minimum probability of error will be one half of one minus square root of one minus sigma square. This will uh, come again and again, okay? Sure. Now there is one more uh, concept which I want to discuss. Uh, before we move on, that is, from here, one thing can be immediately noticed, okay? So, we saw that the probability of error, the minimum probability of error depends only on sigma, which is the scalar product between C1 and C2, and the prior probabilities, right? So, if, when you are already given with these two vectors like this, okay? When you are already given these two vectors like this, you have a certain scalar product between these two things. Now, if I rotate these vectors in any way, okay? If I rotate this vector in any way, this angle is not changing, right? So that means the scalar product is remaining the same when you even if even when you rotate these two vectors, though. And the minimum probability of error is independent of that. You see this? Uh, the if as long as you rotate the vector or do a unitary transformation, okay. You, if you just apply a unitary transformation for to both C1 and C2, then the minimum probability of error is not changing. Okay, that is an important uh, concept for us, and uh, this is one manipulation we can do before our measurement. Okay, you can position your states in whichever way you want without uh, jeopardizing your you know minimum probability of error. And we write it more formally here. We have two vectors. You do some minimum a unitary transformation, and then you know the scalar product doesn't change. If you as long as you do a unitary transformation, the scalar product doesn't change. Inner product between C1, C2, and C1, C2 both are same. Okay, so in that case, the probability of error is not going to change. Sure. Uh, now, uh, what we are going to do is so this with this understanding, we can now look at. Uh, uh, BPSK symbols. BPSK means uh, we'll describe that. We'll describe that in a, in a moment. BPSK symbols and uh, discriminating these two symbols. So what we did here was, if you are given with two general states C1 and C2, and the one moment measurement, uh, which which minimizes the probability of error, we are going to now specialize to that two fixed states C1 and C2. We are going to take it as let's say alpha and minus alpha. That is called B BPSK, a coherent state. Uh, discrimination and b stands for binary p for phase this for shift and uh, oh, okay for what keying keying sorry yeah <laughs> yeah uh, bpsk means binary phase shift keying coherent state discrimination sure so that means instead of c1 and c2 in our previous slide we are going to take alpha and minus alpha okay that is binary phase shifted okay the same alpha we take but we just phase shift it with uh, a minus and then let's take alpha to be a real number for the time being. And then the scalar product between this alpha and minus alpha, it is e to the power minus 2n. This is a calculation which we can do uh, from the you know uh, definition of the coherent state alpha. I'm not giving the details here, but uh, it is 
it can be easily computed using the definition of the coherent state alpha and minus alpha, of course. All right. And here we also know that the mean photon number is mod alpha square. And uh, these are positioned like this. And uh, these are the corresponding waves. And uh, we know from the previous discussion, okay, in the, from the previous uh, discussion, we know the minimum probability of error is this one, okay. It just depends on the uh, prior probability with which you send this and then the, uh, you know, prior probability and the angle between um, your alpha and minus alpha. And in this case, the scalar product between alpha and minus alpha is e to the power minus 2n. Therefore, when you try to discriminate BPSK symbols, the, whatever be the, uh, receiver, the receiver you may choose, okay, you can choose several different kinds of receiver. You can choose different, different kinds of, you know, we just saw one receiver, which is earlier, which we discussed where was that photon number detection, right? That was detection plus ML decision rule. That is one receiver. We can use any kind of measurement, any kind of receiver mechanism, okay? Whatever you may use, the minimum probability of error is going to be at least this much. So that is a general fact, which we get from our previous discussion. All right. Now, is there a, so we had seen, this is the minimum probability of error. Now the question is, that is a quantum mechanical limit, okay? Quantum mechanics tells us that if you try to discriminate these two states of light, there is a minimum probability of error and that probability of error is, okay, one assumption here is the one Neumann measurement is what we do, uh, what we take here. There are different other kinds of measurements, but uh, in this situation, what happens is that the one Neumann measurement itself is the measurement which uh, gives you the minima, uh, minimum probability of error. But what kind of a receiver, you know, one a measurement plus a measurement basis plus a decision rule. These two things together gives us a receiver, right? So what kind of a receiver will achieve this kind of a minimum probability of error? That's an important question. And that's a uh, one of the most important questions that this kind of a question, you know, a quantum mechanical limit is known, but what kind of a system will achieve that limit? So that is a question here. For the, for the luckily for the case of BPSK, there is a famous receiver called uh, Dolinar receiver. Dolinar receiver. Uh, this came from Samuel Dolinar from MIT. His PhD thesis in 1976. We are not going to going to we are not going to the details of Dolinar receiver, but just know that there exists a receiver mechanism. Okay, uh, it is a hypothetical receiver. Uh, we are not able to make it, you know, physically in the lab, but there is a, uh, you know. Uh, feedback loop involved and there is a way to, you know, um, there's a description of this uh, receiver which will achieve the minimum probability of error for BPSK symbols. And uh, one thing to note here is that it is easy to derive the minimum probability of error for discriminating the BPSK or, you know, any general two states, but it is a non-trivial task to find an actual receiver design, that is measurement basis plus decision rule that achieves this minimum probability of error. Very good. So once again, where are we now? We are, uh, we started with this thing. You want to send a signal and receive that reliably. Okay. And uh, we, we didn't uh, use noise yet. Noise will come in the second part of this course. And uh, first we learned uh, this keying. Okay. The keying is on-off keying, which is you send either zero or alpha and then try to detect it using photon number basis and uh, ML decision rule. And then we saw the, uh, we derived the minimum probability of error inherent in uh, using a one Neumann measurement plus the ML decision rule, which we had earlier. And we derived the probability of error. And third one, if you specialize this situation, if you specialize that situation to a B, to BP escape symbols, that means alpha and minus alpha, there is a receiver design called a Dolinar receiver. Uh, which is a theoretical receiver design, which achieves that minimum probability of error. Very good. What we are now going to do is that we are going to learn another uh, detection mechanism or a receiver design, which is called a homodyne detection and a maximum likelihood uh, decision rule. Okay. And after that, we will see some demonstration of this thing from uh, Jack's codes. All right. So once again, uh, to set the premise, we have a square pulse and we detect the number of photons. So that so the what is it? The measure, measurement basis is just your uh, photon number basis. Once again, you just measure the number of photons which you receive. But after that, what we are going to do is that we apply some gain to this thing. Okay. So what happens here? If you just have this much, okay, and you you know that by now that 
this k the number of photons the random variable number of photons follows a poisson distribution which is dependent on your mean photon number okay so you have a square pulse which is a coherent state alpha with a mean photon number n and then you detect the photons at the end you get a uh, the distribution of the detection statistics okay the number of photons you receive is uh, follows a poisson distribution with the mean photon number n all right now also we had seen that there is a uh, approximation for if n is very large okay if n is very large this thing can be approximated using your uh, a normal distribution okay with the same mean and uh, uh, same variance okay so that is what we are going to use in the homodyne detection so that means if you want to use the homodyne detection you want to have your pulse to be really large photon number okay so then only you can approximate it using a gaussian so uh, that is one thing one thing but here since we want to make the detection and uh, we want to use our decision rule to get a guess of what was initially sent our aim is always to guess what was initially sent right so to do that we do some more you know uh, post processing here what we do is that we apply a gain to it and we run this experiment to a specific number of you know uh, a specific amount of time and you get an output just just uh, instead of this number at the output we just multiply that number with you know certain parameters that's all we are doing here okay so that uh, this random variable k is multiplied with two different two more parameters that we uh, that is one is a gain and that one is, this is the amount of time normalized amount of time you conduct this experiment for so this is the basic premise for uh, homodyne detection now we will see how to use this kind of a mechanism to guess after you get this one you want to guess your you know original pulse which was given to you that's what we are going to do in one homodyne detection okay so what we should remember here is poisson lambda is can be approximated using uh you know normal distribution lambda lambda when lambda is really large and when lambda is really really large if you have this output okay this is again a poisson okay and that will be approximated using Gaussian and that approximation, the mean of that Gaussian will be this number, okay, and the variance will be this number. That is, that comes from the approximation between Poisson and um, uh, Gaussian. Sure. Now, let's go to the homodyne detection. So, our aim is to discriminate between alpha and minus alpha, okay, BPSK symbols. And we are going, suppose, let's say we were sent alpha, okay, so don't worry about this huge picture. Just look at this part of the picture, okay? We are presented with alpha, let's say, okay? Now, I also, I, alpha can be of any mean photon number, okay? So we don't, we, we can't control that, let's say. With some mean photon number alpha we got, we are presented with. Now, what we want, if we want to use the homodyne detection, you want to make it a really large pulse, okay? So what we do is that we put a local oscillator and then mix these two lights, okay? We put a very large local oscillation and another coherent state with very large photon number, let's say. And then we, we mix these two things. This thing is, for the time being, it's a balanced mixing of alpha and alpha LO. This thing will be called as a beam splitter. And in the later part of the course, we will see, you know, what is the mathematical definition of this guy. But just for the time being, just imagine that these two light, uh, light is allowed to interfere in a specific fashion. And after the interference, we are going to get uh, two lights as the output. And the first output is going to be alpha plus alpha LO. That means alpha plus alpha LO divided by square root of two. And the second output, this is a constructive interference here. And we, have, we get a destructive interference here, alpha minus alpha LO divided by square root of two. Okay, so we had initial light, uh, it was alpha, and we want this is what we want to, you know, guess at the end of the, you know, this process. And given an alpha, we just apply a very large local oscillator, another coherent state alpha, and we mix it. And then at the end, you get two different light. One is alpha plus alpha LO divided by square root of two, another is alpha minus alpha LO divided by square root of two, and you do the photon number. Uh, measurement at the end so at the both the arms of this beam splitter okay at the both the arms here we do uh you know photon number counting and and the thing which we did earlier you know you apply some gain and then you run the experiment for for some time decide how how long you are going to run the experiment and you get some output okay fine and we know that this y uh at the output can be approximated using Ga gaussian that is what our basic premise is okay now what we get is that the first output here that will follow a poisson with uh, you know 
this mean photon number. This is the mean. So if you are given with this, this state, the mean absolute value square of this guy is the mean photon number for this wave. Okay. So we gave get a n plus. Okay. N plus is defined as the absolute value square of the alpha plus alpha euler divided by square root of two mod square. And n minus is the alpha minus alpha euler divided by square root of two mod square. So that is the Poisson distributions we get from this arm and this arm respectively. Fine. Then at the end, when we combine this together, we get this. This is your final random variable, k plus minus k minus. You get k plus from uh, k plus is this one and k minus is, is this one. At the end, you know, from the two outputs combined, we get one output here. Sure. Now, what happens is that when alpha is really, an alpha LO is really large or the way, uh, mean photon number at the output here is really large. What we know is that this can be approximated to using Gaussian distributions, okay? And the Gaussian distribution will get this mean and this variance. Sure, that much is same as what we saw in the previous slide. And after this thing, what we can do is that if you choose the scaling constant, so these are the constants which we, which we put, right? So these these are under our control. This is at the, the receiver mechanism. So this is our, these are our, our under our under our control. We can choose these constants in such a way that this number mu, okay, is going to be alpha itself. So we start with a real number for the time being. In this experiment here, we start with a real number alpha, and uh, we do this mechanism. And what we can show after we do this thing is that we can choose this number Q, S, and G. So in such a way that this normal distribution is going to be centered at alpha. The mean of the normal distribution is alpha. That means we just need to make sure that this thing, what you get at the end is alpha, okay? And there's a variance, which is called the short noise limit. This is going to be one by four. This is small computation starting from, all the details are here. If you do a computation, we'll get that. At the end, this is going to be an alpha, and this is a normal distribution with uh, mean alpha and variance one over four. So now, do you understand how do we uh, guess, make a guess of the you know which was sent to you? Whatever is the mean number, right? What whatever is the mean you get from you get for your normal distribution, that is your guess for your uh, light which was initially sent, and that is how we set the other constant. That is why we do this stuff here. And this is how we make a decision. Once we get this thing, we get, a, okay, so you got a normal distribution alpha and one over four mass ended at alpha with variance one over four. This is a fixed thing. Doesn't depend on whatever alpha you may choose. The variance is always the same thing for this for this case, okay? So we, we make the guess that, okay, it is alpha was given to you. Now, how to use this to di distinguish between alpha and minus alpha? That is the next question. So now in this slide, what we did was alpha was sent. Now you... Of recovered that alpha here in the, the output of your uh, homodyne detection. Now, let's see how do we use this mechanism to discriminate between alpha and minus alpha. Okay, so this is called a balance detector because you know we have this half here and uh, this, there's a symmetric way of doing this thing. <laughs> sure. Now, we want to discriminate BPSK using homodyne detection. Okay, now in this case, let's say we have an alpha and a minus alpha and we do this, you know, uh, homodyne detection, whatever we were doing for the same thing, whatever we were doing in this case, we just don't know whether it was alpha was given to you or minus alpha was given to you. And then we do this uh, mechanism and at the end we get a normal distribution. There are two types of normal distributions which we can get. Either, either it is ended at minus alpha, okay? <clears throat> or secondly, it was ended at plus alpha. Just a second. These are the two distributions, possible distribution. And from here, you want to make a decision whether it was alpha was given to you or minus alpha was given to you. Okay, so how we are putting in my uh, maximum likelihood detection rule here. What is the detection rule I am going to put? <clears throat> At the end, I get a random variable y and the value of the y. Okay, so that value of y can be on this side or on this side, right? So value of y can be positive or negative. And if the value of y is positive, you see that there's a maximum chance. Okay, the most probability is most probably it is the you know, alpha was given to you. And if the value of y was a negative, alpha has only this much probability at the negative negative axis, right? So it is very likely that it was a uh, minus alpha was given. So this is a decision rule we make. And of course, there is a probability of error. So you may get a positive value for y, even when, you know, this was given, because there's a small probability with which you get, you get a positive value for the 
uh, output variable even when minus alpha was given. Similarly, even from when from alpha was given, there's a small probability that at the end your y random variable can take a negative value. Okay, but we are taking this decision rule based on maximum likelihood decision rule that says that we choose the we decide that it was alpha was given when y is positive and minus alpha was given when y is negative. Of course, there is a uh, as we discussed, there is a probability of error and probability of error once again from this you know uh, prob probability density function formula we know that this is a gaussian which is centered at minus alpha and this is a gaussian which is centered at plus alpha now we can compute the probability of error the same formula probability of error uh, like we discussed earlier the you know prior times probability of two given one plus probability of one given two so if you just do compute that there is another computation which is left out here we get this thing. So just recall this function, just remember this function ERFC of z, of z is defined as 2 over square root of pi, so z to infinity e to the power minus t square dt, okay? This is your error function. And probability of error when you are given a alpha or minus alpha, which with mean photon number n is ERFC at the point square root of 2n, okay? This integral, you have to start from the, you know, minus square root of 2n. That is a probability of error while discriminating BPSK. Now, these two examples, okay, uh, we have direct detection and homodyne. So, direct detection was just counting your photons and then making the decision according to the number of counts, okay, that is used for um, on-off key, we used that. Then we had a, a your BPSK, that means alpha or minus alpha are given to you. You do this homodyne mechanism at the end, you get a random variable y and uh, you have this decision mechanism and the pro probability of error. These two things, let us try to visualize these two things in uh, our Jupiter examples. Okay, so maybe I'll uh, send it over to Jack. Uh, Jack, can you uh, start? A yeah, session? We'll, we're going to hop over um, to the code again right now. So I'm going to first, yeah, keep this up on the screen. Um, so last time there's a few people that understandably had some confusion. One, because my screen wasn't sharing and two, um, because I had sent the link for that GitHub link. Um, that GitHub link is not the one you need to go to directly. Uh, what it is, is the one that you'll type into Colab. So um, I am going to uh, walk through the steps once more here, um, and then um, we'll continue on kind of that same section that we looked at before, section one. Um, and then I think after this, we'll have a short break. Is that right, TJ? Yes, yes. Okay, so yeah. Um, so. I'm going to take over screen share again, um, and I am going to share um, my browser. So cool. Um, can everyone see it this time? Let's, let's verify that. Um, Tiju if, or if someone in the chat could uh, just comment or Q&A. OK, I see a raised hand. I'm going to assume that means we're good to go. OK, so then uh, when you go to collab. Google, you can just type in collab.google and it'll take you to this homepage. Um, once you're on this homepage, there's a button on the top left that says open collab. When you click that, um, it'll take you to a different page and there will be a pop-up screen uh, where you can say open notebook and you can choose from like examples or recent or Google Drive or wherever. Here is where you will select GitHub and then this is where you'll plug in um, the GitHub link that I shared. And it seems like there was some issue um, with copying from Zoom, which I wasn't aware of. So um, yeah, it, unfortunately, you might have to type it out manually or like copy it into a notepad quick and then put it in here. But um, the link is https colon backslash slash uh, github.com, then my name, and then winter school, all with slashes. Um, so once you have that in there, hopefully it can be copied from Zoom somehow. Um, and you click the little search icon on the right side, then there should be a pop-up thing just below that, which gives you the direct link to the notebook that I created. So then you can just click on this um, and it should launch a new notebook for you right here. So you shouldn't have to install anything locally. Um, no need to open up any programs. It should just be a web browser. Um, and then it, you should be able to run it in here. Um, you'll have to run this very first cell, um, which installs uh, SciPy and Strawberry Fields, which we're using Strawberry Fields in quite a bit of this. Um, this one takes a minute to run, so you can just like hit that and let it run in the background. Um, I'm going to go back to the one that I already did this in. Um, last time, um, I went through two parts of this. Um, one where we just looked at modeling a Poisson point process, um, 
and then seeing it converge to a Gaussian. Um, and then also further down, um, we looked at uh, visualizing the coherent states with the Wigner function in phase space. Um, so yeah, feel free to play around with those again. The key things to change are um, changing the mean value up above, and then also you can change uh, the amplitude of the coherent state. But there's a little more in the section that I skipped over previously. Um, so just below uh, the Poisson process, there's another section which uh, does some sampling of Gaussian distributions. Um, so I'm going to decrease the sample number on these just so we can run it quickly. But feel free to run like a large sample size if you want. Um, and then this is just going to show you what the type of distribution would look like that we would expect um, from a cohere from BPSK encoding with a homodyne receiver. So um, I only ran a few samples, so it doesn't look awesome, but you can definitely see the Gaussian shape taking form um, where we have these mean values of uh, one and minus one. Um, and so I saw someone in the chat ask, like, how would you make the decision? Like, how would you make the decision rule if y is greater than or less than um, zero? Um, so I guess there's a few points to that. So if I have a, just a distribution that I'm getting a random variable from, um, I'm assuming that I have some digital readout of that, or like that's a value that's actually presented to me in the lab. I'm not abstracting that value from something else. So, so in this case, I'm sampling something and I get a value. And at that one time, my digital readout says I have a value of, let's say it's minus 0.6 or something like that. Um, now the decision rule is something I choose. Do I map that to say that I was given minus one or do I map that to say that I was given one? Um, in this case, it's it's pretty clear that everything greater than zero should probably go to one and everything less than should probably go to negative one. Um, and while you will have errors in that, that is the uh, maximum likelihood decision point. So at each value, you can also calculate and say, well, is it more likely that this value came from distribution one or from distribution two, and then just pick the highest one. Um, in this case, it's simple. You just, you always know that if it's greater than one or greater than zero, sorry, map it to one. If it's less than map it to minus one. So this is just purely in a, um, like a statistics problem. In Homodyne, um, the question gets a little bit more interesting because you actually have to choose the gain value, uh, which I saw someone mention in the chat. Um, and you have to choose the normalization constant that uh, you're going to plug in in your digital circuit that's going to eventually read this out because what you want to eventually do uh, is map the actual value that you read out so it's going to be some value on your screen or on a sensor map that to the coherent amplitude because that's what you're trying to read off um, and so there will be some noise in that for sure um, if it's a high amplitude coherent state and um, your two distributions are already pretty well separated then the added Gaussian noise of the gain shouldn't be an issue because you're just changing the variance of your Gaussian. Um, but yes, with low amplitude coherent states, there almost certainly would be, um, yeah, you, you would basically change the amount of crossover probability. So anyways, long story short, Homodyne um, is a realization of a physical system that's doing a sampling of two Gaussian distributions, and you have to make a rule that helps you decide which one you want to pick. So um, in strawberry fields here, um, I am defining a function, which we're going to call BPSK sample homodyne. Uh, and what we're giving it is we're giving it a coherent amplitude alpha, um, and it will generate the converse minus alpha of that. So you can give it a real or complex value here, and it should work just fine either way. Um, and it'll just move the other one to a pi phase shift. So um, it's just going to take one mode, um, and then uh, we're going to use the Gaussian backend because we're working with BPSK, which is a coherent state. Um, and then in the first mode, it's just going to generate that state. Um, and then it's going. we're going to go ahead and just measure homodyne. Um, this is a bit simplistic. We're, we're not really adding in any of the components or considering any of the noise. But um, this is meant to show you that strawberry fields can be a really easy tool to, to try and problem solve or like work through these problems um, in relative simplicity. So it already is a built-in homodyne measurement. Um, so we can run this. Uh, so. I already have defined the circuit. Um, and now I'm going to say, let's sample it. Uh, I'm going to go down to just a thousand times for now. Um, we're just going to sample this circuit a thousand times and see uh, what value we get. So I gave it, um, I gave it a value of one here. We'll let that run. So it gives a ton of values. Um, 
there should be a plot. Oh, cool. Okay, so to give me what's approaching a Gaussian, um, since I didn't do very many samples, it doesn't look like it's very Gaussian, but it's definitely there. Um, and one other thing to note, um, so actually I see that this has a mean value of two. Um, so strawberry fields has a back end where you tell it what value of H bar you want to use, which is necessary to define the the basis over which you're you're operating. Um, so I think in this case the default H bar was two, and so it's going to give me a value of two. But um, nevertheless, this is this is uh, the type of distribution we expect to see. So um, we're able to really quickly sample homodyne in here. Um, although yeah, keep in mind there's a normalization value that needs to be changed. Um, and I guess this goes back to the question of like, how do you actually choose that decision value of why? Um, well, whatever digital value you're getting out, you need to make sure that you're properly normalizing um, you know, your, your backend for that. Um, cool, so um, I think then the next thing was, yeah, going back and uh, visualizing the coherent states. So that was nice. And then visualizing the Fox states. So that's the end now of all of the section one stuff. Um, so section one covered, what are the states? How do we visualize them? Uh, what are the modulation schemes? Um, how can we detect them? What statistics do we expect? Um, and then, yeah, what are some basic receiver designs? So um, hopefully everyone is able to actually get this up and running now that wants to at least. Um, yeah, if you have questions, keep throwing them in the chat. We will come back to this again um, later to look at some more of it. Um, but yeah, we're going to take a break now. We're at exactly um, 11 o'clock Tucson time. So uh, Tiju, how long uh, should we take the break for? Uh, you're so muted. it's 11 now. Maybe let's take a 15 minutes break. Yeah. Okay. I'll put that in the chat in case anyone's already. So yeah, we'll start in exactly 15 minutes. Huh? Sounds good. Good. Thank you. I think we have about a minute before our break ends. Uh, before we get started again, um, was there any more questions uh, from anyone who was trying to get onto um, the collab code and still uh, having issues? I, I think we maybe nice. solved all the issues, so that's yeah. that's good. Um, okay, uh, I hope everybody's back. We can start. So where are we now? So we had this task here and we want to send a message and uh, we saw without considering noise, we just tried to see if you, how uh, two ways of encoding this data into the signal, you know, we mainly saw on off key and uh, BPSK symbols. And then we looked at two receiver designs, in fact, three. One is a Dolinar receiver, we didn't look at it uh, fully, but for BPSK, homodyne detection was the last one we discussed. And initially we started with ideal photon detector uh, plus an ML decision for the on-off keying. So first we learned the probability of error using the coherent states zero and alpha. This is called on-off keying and uh, direct detection, photon number basis plus ML decision rule as the receiver design. Then secondly, it was probability of error, minimum probability of error that is inherent in a one and measurement plus ML detection receiver design for two general states. Not that the actual design of a receiver that achieved the theoretical limit of probable minimum probability of error is a difficult task. We had seen Dolnar receiver for the case of alpha and minus alpha. Thirdly, we discussed a receiver design called homodyne detection for the discriminating BPSK symbol that is alpha or minus alpha. Also, we discussed certain codes that help us visualize and uh, compare what we learned in strawberry fields. Thanks to Jack for that. And uh, well, now what we are trying to do is that, now we try to see whatever we are we were doing here, okay? This part here as a, an information channel, okay? As uh, Cloud Shannon developed the information theory, okay? So we are trying to put this, whatever we are doing in the framework of information theory, we will see one or two, uh, one specifically one source of a noise source and uh, we try to see how much data we can send now we, till now we were only discussing how to send the data how to detect the uh, receive the data okay we never thought of the question how much data can you send you know when you send a light pulse 
let let's say it be you know a modulation say it be zero alpha or alpha minus alpha how much data can be sent how many bits of uh, information can be sent per use of this channel okay per use is once uh, you know one you know choy one uh, one time we send this you know symbol uh, alpha or minus alpha or zero whatever that is the question we are going to be concerned here and we need to do and uh, we need to recall a little bit of information theory for that mostly a few definitions and a statement of a theorem and we will have to assume that to go further okay what is an information channel so an information channel is a set of source symbols and a, a set of you know output symbols there are some inputs and some output and every time you send an uh, you send an in input you have an input there's a probability distribution playing a role here. There's a probability of receiving a certain variable y given that some x was sent. So x takes value, let's say, uh, little x's and y takes value capital Y's. And what happens here is that we receive y when x is sent. And there is a probability of receiving y when x was sent. This is what, uh, it is an abstract definition of a channel, okay? So we were seeing, till now, we were actually seeing some examples of channel where we uh, you know, zero or alpha was were sent. And then at the end, we made, you know, uh, some measurement and some guess. And at the end, we decided whether it was zero or alpha was given again, you know, or, you know, a, a zero or alpha were given here. And then at the end of the homodyne, we, we got another probability distribution y. And from there, we made a, another guess whether zero or alpha were there, okay, was sent. So this is what an information channel is, okay? So for example, a general channel, for example of a channel is let's say X is taking values one, two, and Y is taking one, two, and three, okay? Then let's say that uh, when one was given, so probably there's a certain probability with which you receive one itself at the end, and certain probability with which you receive two, there's a certain probability with which you receive three, et cetera, okay? So since I, I took three here just to note that even though you send only two symbols, there may be three different you know, outputs you may be getting. You know, it is not that you will always get the same thing. It can be it can be some A, B, C. For illustration purpose, we use one, two, three itself here, but it can be an A, B, C for anything, you know. Any number of outputs can you get. You, you may send something discrete, you may end up getting something continuous. The other way, you may send something continuous, but you may end up getting something discrete. Anything ha can happen. It is just a transformation between a probability distribution at the input and a probability distribution at the output. And uh, Associated with this thing, there is a matrix. Matrix of receiving one when one was sent, receiving three when two was sent, like that. So this is called a transition probability matrix. The matrix T called the transition probability matrix is the mathematical description of an information channel. So those who have heard about a little bit of matrices, uh, heard a little bit about matrices, will immediately realize that this is a doubly stochastic matrix, meaning if you sum all these numbers on the first row, you will get one. These are all positive numbers. If you sum all these uh, first row, you will get one. This is a property of your conditional probability distribution, okay? And similarly, if you sum over all the columns, this column will give you some one. This column, some, if you sum this guy with this guy, you will get one. And once again, this plus this will be one. So all the columns will add to one, all the rows will add to one. That such kind of matrices with positive entries are known as st doubly stochastic matrices. So the doubly stochastic matrix is a mathematical description of a of an information channel. All right, how to how to fit our system into that? So let's see another example. This is an abstract example. Let's let's see something more concrete, which uh, we were using in telegraph model. Okay. So this is a called a binary symmetric channel, okay? What is a binary symmetric channel? Of course, you have some input variables, some output variables, and uh, here for binary symmetric channel, input and output are same, okay? Input is, let's say, one and two here, and output is also same as one and two. The important thing to note is, uh, note is that the probability of receiving two when one was sent, okay, is same as probability of receiving one when two was sent, okay? So we had this, transition probability matrix here, if it's a, uh, the, uh, this matrix, if it is symmetric, okay? So that means probability of receiving two when one was given and probability of receiving one when two was given. If these two things are equal, we call it as a binary symmetric channel because we I already told that this should add up to one. Therefore, if once this is fixed, this number is already fixed and this number is already fixed, right? So it's only one variable here and uh, that determines everything else. <clears throat> 
So that is called a, a binary symmetric channel. And uh, the question is how many bits can be sent reliably per channel use, okay? So before answering this question, what we will see is that the examples which we saw today, the main examples which we saw today, both fall under this category of Shannon channels, okay? Binary symmetric channels. And uh, we will see how. Let us think of BPSK and the Dolinar receiver, okay? BPSK means alpha or minus alpha is being sent. And uh, Dolinar receiver is the receiver design which gives you the minimum probability of error, okay? And the point is that if you do this thing, there is a probability of receiving two when one is given and there's a probability of receiving one when two is given, right? These are the probability of error. And we can see that these two are same numbers and that number is just the minimum probability of error, okay? So that is what I put and why here. Uh, it is just about thinking or proving that two given one and one given two are same, okay? So that we can prove here. And the BPSK modulation with Dolinar receiver is an example of a binary symmetric cha Shannon channel, okay? Shannon channel means everything is classical, okay? Even though we sent, uh, you know, coherent states, which are semi-classical, the channel at the end, whatever we get, we, whatever we see here, the whole thing together as P of Y given X, that, uh, you know, transition probability metrics, it is just a classical channel, okay? Similarly, homodyne receiver. Here also we have the same property, the probability of two given one and the one given two. Okay, homodyne desiccation detection, it's again for by BPSK and the same property, uh, two given one and one given two, they have the same probability, which is given by the error function, which we discussed. This error function was discussed when, you know, uh, we discussed the homodyne receiver and we don't need to know the precise, you know, value of this function right away. We don't have to remember right away, but it is there in our slides. And when we want to do the computations, we can use that. Okay. Sure. So uh, what we have seen are two examples of binary symmetry. What is a bi symmetry? But what is a Shannon channel? That is just the, uh, you know, doubly stochastic matrix. And then uh, transforming one probability distribution to another probability distribution. And the whole thing, one probability distribution going to another probability distribution, uh, via this uh, transition probability matrix is called a Shannon channel. And uh, an example of a Shannon channel we saw is binary symmetric channel. And this is the main property of binary symmetric channel. And the main examples which we discussed today, BPSK with Dolinar and BPSK with uh, Homodyne, both are binary symmetric channels. So there is an exercise here if you want to try what is the channel induced by ideal photon number detection for on-off keying, okay? So that is not a binary symmetric, I can tell you, but that's a food for thought. Uh, if you're interested, you can think. The question is, what is the channel induced by ideal photon detection with the uh, on-off keying? On-off keying with ideal photon detection, okay. Uh, you will get, uh, you will see, uh, you you get a transition probability matrix and uh, uh, you can just write down the tra transition probability matrix for that. Okay. We are not putting a poll or anything, but you can think about it. Sure. So now the question, now I will go back to this question I asked here. How many bits can be sent reliable, reliably per channel use? To do that, we need to understand the concept of entropy. Okay. So this is a concept which was introduced by Cloud Shannon in its famous 1948 paper. Uh, the information theory paper. And uh, we want to describe what is the entropy of a probability distribution. Uh, and also we will discuss what is known as the uh, channel coding theorem. <coughs> entropy. So now forget about everything else we have done till now. Just think about a simple probability space of binary probability space. That means you have a one and two one is coming with the probability p and two is with the probability one minus p okay then the entropy of this binary value random variable is defined as minus p log p log to the base two is what we usually use in the information theory and minus minus p log p minus one minus p log log one minus p this function in terms of p and you know h2 of p this is defined as little h2 of p this is the binary entropy okay of this random variable, which takes value one uh, with probability p and one minus p with probability two. And it can be plotted like this, okay? It achieves the maximum value at half, okay? Then if you, so this is for the binary value random variable. If a random variable is, uh, you know, uh, takes m possible values, then you have the entropy is defined as summation pi log pi and the sum runs over one to m, okay? Minus of summation pi log pi, that is your entropy. So this quantity, entropy, uh, we can, in fact, uh, you one, one can run a whole session on, you know, entropy alone. 
but we just need to know this definition and probably one one more slide i'll have to do for with definitions because we want to understand from the entropy we want to go to what is known as information or mutual information and then these things will play a role in the uh, number of the, the capacity of a channel capacity meaning number of bits one can uh, send you know using one channel use sure and uh, more definitions now. So just keep this in mind. The entropy, the definition of an entropy of a random variable, random variable which takes value p1, p2, pn with, uh, oh, sorry, 1, 2, 3, up to m with, uh, you know, these probabilities, p1, p2, pn, this pi log pi, that's it, okay? Some minus of summation, pi log pi. And if it's a continuous random variable, it is called a differential entropy. We don't have to deal with that. Uh, there's a similar definition for that using integration. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Mutual inter information. So the interpretation of uh, you know joint and conditional entropy so we'll discuss what is a kind of joint entropy conditional entropy all these things okay and this quantity information is going to play a role here and to define the information uh, mutual information between x and y we need to know this what is known as the you know uh, conditional entropy okay let's start so if you have if you have two random variables you can you have a joint distribution for these two random variables okay i didn't discuss what exactly is a joint distribution but i suggest that you go back to probability theory and recall what is a joint distribution a two random variables you have a joint distribution and that's again a uh, you know uh, distribution and that distribution gets a uh, entropy that's called the joint entropy and then if you just fix a second variable again okay? so after the two random variables if you fix the second random variable and consider the conditional probability distribution okay so when x2 is a taking a particular value n2 you consider the conditional probability distribution and then consider the entropy of that distribution that is called the uh, conditioned conditional entropy conditioned on the fact that here it is conditioned on a fixed value n2 of x2 okay now so there is a you know uh, mu uh, uh, conditional entropy the total conditional entropy is just the sum over n2 for all the conditional entropy and then the probability this is the this is the average of all the conditional entropies averaged with respect to your second distribution okay so second distribution is the conditioned distribution so we have the x2 values are x2 is equal to n2 then we have the conditional probability and you have the conditional entropy okay now take all the values of x2 and then i'll take the average with respect to probability of x2 you get it as the uh, this is the um, uh, conditional entropy using these two quantities okay the entropy of a random variable and the conditional entropy between x and y we can define what is known as the information okay we don't have time to discuss more about this but for our understanding of the rest of the course just look at this line here okay the quantity i x y which is known as the mutual information between the random variables x and y is defined as the entropy of x minus the conditional entropy h of x given y okay so this is uh, the amount of information y can convey about x and uh, if we go back and discuss about this uh, two slides a little bit more we will understand the you know uh, meaning of these definitions okay uh, so now the channel coding theorem this is a theorem which we are going to assume this is a very simple uh, explanation here mm, it say it just says this much okay the, it's, it talks about the number of bits you can send per channel use okay so let's assume that we have two classical probability distributions x and y okay and x goes through the channel and you get y this is what we were discussing till now and uh, uh, we need one assumption is that you know it's an independent uh, every time you use the channel there is nothing uh, it is independent of, so once i use it the second time when i use it it is independent of the previous case and when i use it again it is again independent of the other two cases so the each use of the channel is independent so there is no nothing changing in the channel when we you know use it again and again and the output every time you get does not depend on anything else okay that's what independent means okay the number of bits that can be communicated faithfully over n uses of the channel is n times c where c is this one so this is the importance of that quantity information information between x and y is h of x minus h of x given by h is the entropy so you what is the max what is the you know uh, where c is the you know uh, number of bits that can be transmitted per use of the channel reliably okay reliably means you are able to distinguish it at the end so there are some codings coming there but for our understanding just we don't go into any of those things now just imagine that given a channel like this there is a quantity which depends on this random variable x and y which is called the mutual information 
And if you maximize the mutual information over the prior probabilities, okay, over X, okay, mutual information is maximized over all prior probabilities with the X can assume, that is called the capacity of a channel. That is the number of bits that can be transmitted per use of the channel. C is the capacity of the channel. And that C is going to be, the formula for C is that maximize over all possible priors of the, uh, or uh, maximize the quantity information X given Y, okay? That is the channel coding theorem. I know that I have gone a little fast here, but we can use this to, you know, uh, do what is given to us at hand, okay? Sure, now what happens here is that, so we saw this classical channel and then we saw the, uh, you know, what is the, in the capacity of that channel. And then now we know we have a binary symmetry. We come back to our example of binary symmetric channel. Once again, you know, uh, P and, so your matrix will be one minus P, 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 one minus P. That matrix, the binary symmetric, binary symmetric channel. And uh, the capacity is just by, you know, uh, computing the quantity in I, X, Y, and then maximizing it over all the possible priors. So once again, here, there is a computation involved here. There's a small exercise. And if you do this computation, if you do this right-hand side computation, okay, write the definition of, you know, H of X, write the definition of X of X, X given Y, and then subtract, we get I, X, Y. And now you apply a maximization over all the possible priors, you know, Q1 minus Q available to you for x, okay, all possible priors. What we can see is that that number c will be one minus the binary entropy, okay? That many bits per use of the channel. That is the uh, entro, that is the check capacity of a Shannon channel. And now we know, uh, since our BPSK plus uh, Dolinar and BPSK plus Homodyne, both are binary symmetric channels, we know the, uh, you know, uh, capacity of these two channels, right? So BPSK with Dolinar, this is our channel, alpha and minus alpha. We At the end, we are applying a Dolinar receiver and uh, we, can, we know the transition probability matrix. If you just know the, you know, uh, <coughs> P, okay? We know the uh, capacity of the channel. H2 of P is well-defined for P and then, uh, so, and then the channel capacity is just one minus H2. H2 is the binary entropy. P1, so P, the minus of P log P minus one minus P log one minus P. That is what the capacity of the BPS cave is dollar. It is just the by, uh, capacity of a binary symmetric channel. Similarly, if you do the uh, modulation BPS cave with a homodyne receiver, once again, we discussed earlier that this is a binary symmetric channel. So we once again has the same formula for uh, capacity, but just the P changes in the previous case, of uh, Dolina receiver, our P was this one. This is the minimum probability of error we had, okay? That was what inducing a uh, Shannon channel, right? The binary symmetric channel, that P was this one. And then with that P, you can get the binary entropy of P1 minus P. That is what the channel capacity for Dolina. And for the homodyne, we get a different P, but the setting is same, it's a binary symmetric channel. And your capacity is uh, one minus H2 of P with P getting this value. This is different from the previous one, sure. Now, let's see what is determining our channel here, okay? So now we are slowly trying to include our noise also. We have this system here. We want to send some message from here to here and we send it through some medium and some noise is picked up, okay? For our purpose in this talk, we are going to deal only with something called loss, okay? So we are initially being initially sending alpha or minus alpha, BPSK symbol once again, and then it goes through some medium and it picks some noise, okay? So at the end, we, you know, uh, instead of alpha, it might be just square root of eta times alpha, between eta is the transmissivity of the, you know, uh, channel, uh, of the channel we have here. Eta is a number between zero and one. You can think that it just got dampened a little bit and you got a smaller number here, okay? And similarly, minus alpha, this again picks up the same kind of a dampening and you apply your receiver. So at the end, what is happening here, you had one, you wanted to send one or two and then you wanted to receive one or, one or two itself and you converted one to alpha. Instead of sending one, you send this light alpha and then you send minus alpha. And at the end, from square root of eta times alpha and square root of, square root of minus of square root of eta times alpha, you, you know, decide whether it was one or two was received by doing one of these receiver mechanism. Now, what is the probability of error here? So here, what are we detecting? At the end, we are going to detect, if your channel had this kind of a transmissivity, 
you are going to be presented either with square root of eta times alpha or with square root, minus of square root of eta times alpha. Even though you initially send alpha and minus alpha, the actual measurement here happens on these numbers, right? These states, either square root of eta times alpha or minus of square root of eta times alpha. Therefore, the probability of error changes in this part of the, in the, in other words, we were looking at this part only in the first part of our course, okay? We are looking just presented with some, uh, you know, BPSK symbols and uh, uh, without any uh, noise, we are just, uh, we were just uh, detecting that. And so now if you want to know the probability of error here, you want to put the, you know, uh, scalar product between these two numbers instead of these two uh, states. These two states have, have to be taken. So therefore, that is why you get a different eta here, okay? So this now, this value eta comes because before, because we are actually measuring this guy here, okay? So therefore, if it is a dolinar, you get a P with uh, the, with this eta value here. And similarly, if it's a homodyne, we get a eta value here. And this is the probability of error. And if you know the probability of error, you know the you know capacity of the channel because of the Shannon's channel coding theorem. All right, this is what uh, uh, it is. And and okay, now what is the, even though we are using this semi-classical, uh, you know, or uh, objects to send this light here, this part is quantum, okay, this much is quantum. But at the end, this is, there's a distribution for X1 and 2, and there's a distribution for 1 and 2 at the end here. So at all these things together constitutes a classical channel, okay? So in the in our setting of BPSK, and any receiver you use, BPSK or a on off keying, whatever modulation format you use, whatever channel you or medium you may use it to send, and whatever will be your receiver mechanism, at the end, as you, you look at it as a probability transformation of a probability, uh, one probability to another probability using this kind of a matrix, it is just a uh, Shannon channel, and that capacity is this one for our binary symmetric channel. All right, now let's compare this. If you try to plot here, the, the probability of error here, and uh, this is n is the mean photon number, and then the, uh, then if you, uh, then the, and, uh, and also plot here that um, uh, angle between angle or the scalar product between your alpha and minus alpha here, and you can try to look at the, you know, probability of error will be moving like this. As n, n increases, this is the mean photon number increasing and the probability of error, okay? This has this kind of a probability. We don't worry about this Kennedy here. This is another kind of receiver. We didn't discuss that. We discussed this homodyne receiver and the, you know, Dolinar. Dolinar gives you the, you know, uh, limit, right? Quantum mechanical limit of probability of error is given by Dolinar and this just depends on the uh, mean photon number and it is distributed like this and against that now you can see what is the this how does the you know capacity is distributed you can also see that <clears throat> here uh, the scalar product between alpha and minus alpha is plotted here as sigma and then the this uh, capacity is plotted here you can see in this case what happens is that dolinar gets higher capacity than uh, homodyne but this is not always the case dolinar achieved the minimum probability of error and it is natural to think that okay that will give the maximum capacity but that's not always the case and we will see such examples towards the end of this course okay uh, so just to know for the time being we have two receivers we discussed one is our homodyne and one is our dolinar and with these receiver receivers the channel capacities behave like this okay so uh, Jack, initially we had planned a break, but I think we don't need a break now. Do you think we need a break now? Um, I think we can push on a little. I mean, we are already kind of getting late in the class. So maybe if we just do a quick break, um, just like a five minute break in case anyone didn't get a chance last time um, or any questions, because I know there's been a lot of content. Um, yeah, here. yeah, so, yeah. Maybe cool. let's just do four minutes because it's according to my watch, it's 1141. So at 1145. Sure. Uh, return. Let's take a four minutes break now so that we can answer some questions in the chat. And because I, I know that I covered a lot in these things. We can answer some questions and uh, you know go forward after in three minutes now. Yeah. Okay, let's start. And uh, yes, so now what we are going to do is uh, we are going to do something. We are going to discuss something called Holevo capacity. So what we did till now after discussing this detection mechanism is uh, we try to see that as a classical channel and try to look at, look at the 
capacity of that channel. Now, what we are going to do is something like, a, since we are using quantum states, right? In our particular examples, it was it was always, it, it they were always alpha or minus alpha coherent states, semi-classical, but generally you can use any quantum state for sending information. And what is the maximum capacity you can achieve, you can hope to achieve? When we discussed the Dolinar's uh, pure state alpha minus alpha or pure state C1 and C2, binary discrimination of pure states, there was a theoretical limit of the limit for the probability of error, right? So similarly, if you use quantum states to send classical information or there's an ultimate limit for how much capacity you can get from the, your channel. Okay, so that capacity is called Holevo capacity. And uh, we are going to briefly see the definition of Holevo capacity or, uh, you know, the formula for Holevo capacity in our setting. When you transfer pure states to pure set, just keep in mind that we are going to discuss only transmission of pure states. We are not going to discuss the uh, mixed state case here. So for the pure states, we want to discuss what is the ultimate capacity so we know. So the assumption is we are sending pure state states and we are receiving pure states. Whatever will be the channel in, involved in between, we don't know. We don't care. What is the ultimate capacity you can get? Just like when we discussed the Dolinar receiver, you know, or before that, you sent two pure states, C1 and C2, and what is the minimum probability of error, which is always inherent in the system? Okay, just like that's a theoretical limit for the detection mechanism. Now, what is the theoretical limit for the capacity? What is the ultimate capacity you can get when you send pure state to pure state? And that is what is called known as the Horevo capacity of the channel. And uh, we need what is known as the von Neumann entropy to describe that. Okay, let's go to that. So let's start with a, a more quantum mechanical way of looking at a state is a density matrix. That is the rank one state C, C. This is actually, you. if you are thinking of, of these as complex vectors, this is a column vector and this is a row vector, which is the com co uh, complex conjugate of this vector. And when you multiply these two things together, you get a matrix, okay? That matrix is known as a density matrix associated with this pure state. And uh, we don't have to deal too much with the pure mixed states, but uh, in the Holevo capacity, we need one situation because of which we are explaining. If you have a bunch of pure states with you and you have a probability distribution with you here and then take a linear combination, this is called a convex form, convex combination of the pure states. This is, this is also, this is known as a density operator, the convex combination of your pure states. Okay. That is another, otherwise called as a mixed state. This is a mixed state, mixed quantum, quantum state. And uh, this state, whether it is this one or this one, this has a property that it trace, that matrix has trace one and it's a positive semi-definite matrix. Uh, by in the positive definiteness itself, we can think, we can take the take it as a self-adjoint matrix. All right. And <laughs> if you have such a, a state, which is a, uh, you know, convex combination of rank one states, in fact, spectral theorem says you tells you that all states, any quantum state you take that is positive, trace one state, any quant any matrix which is positive and uh, trace one, even in the infinite dimensions, if you have you know infinite dimensional operators which which are traceable positive semi-definite operator with trace one, always what you can do is that you can diagonalize that. This means just yeah, you are diagonalizing it in some basis. This is a basis, and then in some basis you are writing it uh, as a diagonal matrix. So you get some eigenvalues. This is how you will write. A general state and if you and a trace is one means what all the uh, diagonal entries of your matrix will sum to one right they are positive numbers that sum to one okay so that means what this is a discrete probability distribution and that discrete probability distribution has a shannon entropy okay so just summation minus pi log pi okay if you do that you get the shannon entropy of this uh probability distribution and that shannon entropy we define as the one Neumann entropy of the state row. So if you have a state row, uh, that means it's a positive operator and it has trace one, then you diagonalize that state, you get all the eigenvalues and you consider this eigenvalues distribution as a probability distribution because it will, it will add to one and the Shannon entropy of that distribution is known as the one Neumann entropy of the state. Okay. Uh, if you have a, now we can see if you have a pure state, what are the eigenvalues of a pure state? The pure state, uh, the eigenvalues are always zero or one. Okay, there is a eigenvalue one and there is eigenvalue zero. 
and if you compute the p log p so p is 0 and 1 minus p is 1 in this case so log of 1 is 0 because of which you will always get the uh, shannon entropy of that uh, distribution to be 0 that is the one norman entropy of pure state is always 0 <clears throat> okay because pure states has either 0 or 1 as its eigenvalues Sure. So once you know the one norman entropy, we can now discuss what is known as a Hollywood capacity of a pure state. Pure state alphabet, you know, uh, a channel which uses pure state to send information. All right. So let's say you have uh, uh, C1 and C2 are given to just this is keep this in my keep our earlier, you know, discussion on the minimum probability of error while detecting C1 and C2 in your mind. Similar situation we are in. We have C1 and C2, two st pure states given to us, and uh, we want to know what is the you know when you when you use this modulation, what is the maximum capacity that can be achieved? Okay, that is a theorem. This is called an HSW theorem, Holevo, uh, Schumacher, and Westmoreland theorem. It says that the maximum capacity you can achieve is the following. It is just the maximizing over all the priors your one norman entropy of this mixture. Okay. This mixture, this you have C1, C2, your pure state, and C2, C2, your another pure state. You have this mixture <clears throat> and maximize over all the possible P's between 0 and but means maximize over all the prior distribution. Okay, just like uh, your classical um, uh, coding theorem, you know, channel coding theorem, where we maximize using all the priors possible for X. Here, maximize using all the prior probabilities for C1 and C2 this quantity okay the one norman entropy of the mixture of c1 and c2 all possible mixture you take in this fashion and that is what the hollywood capacity of the um, this pure state alpha system and that can be proved okay this is another computer so we can we know you know what is if you're if you know of c1 and c2 you can write you know uh, this matrix you can write this matrix and then you can take the convex combination of these two matrices you get this matrix okay that is a computation i'm leaving there <clears throat> And once you have this matrix, you can use the spectral de uh, decomposition to find the, uh, you know, eigenvalue. Just find the eigenvalue, not spectral decomposition, nothing. Just find the eigenvalues of this matrix and uh, find the Shannon entropy of those eigenvalues. Okay. That is the one norman entropy of the state. And uh, maximize over all the P's. This will be a function of P. You have P here and P here. This will be a function of P. <clears throat> Maximize over all P, we can actually prove that this is the binary entropy of 1 minus sigma over 2. So this is the Holevo capacity of this channel. So once again, the Holevo capacity is a theoretical bound. Okay, If you are using the, your pure state C1 and C2 to send uh, information, uh, <clears throat> then regardless of whatever is your uh, you know uh, receiver mechanism, you may use whatever receiver you may want, but you can never get capacity beyond this. That is what the Holevo Schumacher <coughs> Westmoreland theorem says. Okay, this is the ultimate capacity. But once again, just like Dolinar receiver is a theoretical receiver which achieves the maximum uh, minimum probability of error, it is very difficult to come uh, create a uh, nobody knows even you know what is the actual receiver which will achieve this capacity, and this is a an important open question how to improve your capacity you know how to build receivers which will go closer and closer to the polyver capacity so this graph probably uh, i think jack will give show you a few graphs where uh, we will see the gap between uh, the different receivers and the polyver capacity and for the time being i need one more concept before moving it to jack i think that is called the photon in information efficiency so since we are using photon so what we can ask is so Initially, for the channel, we asked the question, how many bits of data can be sent? How many bits of information can be sent in one use of the channel? When we use light to send the information, we can ask how many you know, bits per photon can you send? Bits per photon. How many bits of information can you send per photon? Since we are using light, we use photon. And how many bits per photon you can send? That is called the photon information efficiency. And you can see the channels which we studied are Dolinar uh, plus BPSK. This is for BPSK actually. And uh, Homodyne we studied. You see Dolinar lies here that gives a better capacity. And uh, 
uh, homodynamics here, and you see if you the Holyoke capacity is here, you know, and the photo, uh, photon information efficiency is what we are plotting, and Dolinar is here, and your homodyne is here, and if you look at the capacity, uh, compare it with the Holevo capacity, then it's a big gap here. So how to close this gap is the question, okay? So now probably I will move to uh, Jack for, uh, uh, you know, showing a detection mechanism called joint detection receiver and uh, yep. green machine basically uh, to improve the capacity, okay? How to you improve the capacity using a joint detection receiver? Yeah, perfect. Give me just one second to uh, set up here. Let's switch over. Okay. Um, sorry, actually, let me get my uh, laser. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah, teachers introduced us now to a bunch of topics related to the limits of the capacity of the channel and specifically the limits prescribed by the quantum states that we've chosen for our code words. And there's been a lot of questions in the chat, rightfully so, about, okay, so like, where does this really become quantum? Like, we have this quantum states that we've been working with. Um, and while the measurement itself, the shot noise limited measurement, is a property of the quantum nature of light, it doesn't feel like we've taken advantage of that in any meaningful way. We've just kind of quantified it. So um, I hope this part will give you a little bit more clarity on where you can really consider the quantum state in more detail and why this you know, why you're able to achieve some advantage um, when you consider it. So um, first I wanna back up a little bit and talk about something that was uh, briefly introduced when we were talking about homodyne, which is the beam splitter. Um, so a beam splitter, as probably everyone here knows, allows you to uh, take some input light and split it between multiple outputs. Um, when we're working with coherent states, uh, specifically the beam splitter acts in a really easy to calculate unitary fashion. So um, what's great about that is both that if I'm trying to model these systems and I want to be able to control uh, interference between multiple modes, um, I'm able to do that relatively easily with just linear computations here. The other thing that's key is that it does preserve the state. So um, at the data processing inequality says that as soon as we measure uh, the state and collapse it, we can only deter or, or deteriorate the information that we have. Um, so by using unitary actions, composed of beam splitters, phase shifters, um, potentially any other linear operations. Um, if we can preserve the state, but shift it between multiple modes and kind of prepare it for processing, or I guess really we're doing a pre-processing with the optical system itself prior to detection, we can extract more information out of uh, each symbol. And I think I saw someone just ask a question about, um, are we assuming that we're just measuring each time when we're calculating the label capacity? And no, you're probably already aware of it because you asked that question, but um, that infinity in C infinity for the Halevo capacity assumes that you have an infinite joint detection or that you're able to go over um, an infinite number of, of symbols and perform a collective measurement on them. So the beam splitter is perhaps the key tool in that, and it's going to lead us into a specific structured optical receiver um, that allows you to go beyond the symbol by symbol capacity. So it doesn't get you to um, C infinity, but we'll see in a minute that it gets you above C1. So again, the beam splitter, um, it's a unitary operation. It's great because it preserves the state. We can control these. Um, so in this abstract form, um, we're just controlling the transmissivity. Generally, this is gonna be in the form of a mock sender interferometer or um, potentially a series of them. Um, and that is gonna allow you to change the phase inside there. And then with additional static beam splitters, you're able to create um, an effective ideal beam splitter is something like this, where if I send in two input states that are in uh, separate modes, and that can mean spatially um, or it, like physically different modes, or they could be different modes um, in a waveguide. Um, if I have a beam splitter where two states are coming in and I control the transmissivity, uh, this term eta, then I can control what the two output states are going to be too, while preserving um, all of the, uh, yeah, preserving all the information that was present at the beginning. Um, so the output here, it's just a, it's just a linear action on it. You can see that if I have my input here, here's my unitary, um, and then here's my output. So um, some common things you could do with this, um, you could perform constructive interference and destructive, um, just like we did with the homodyne system to prepare uh, the high and low energy states. Um, and then also you can add a phase. Um, you could do it to one half of the system uh, or potentially to both. 
Um, and then lastly, you could do a displacement on your incoming signal. So um, if you have um, some state that's coming in and you want to just amplify it, um, you can do that. But keep in mind that uh, this is usually not a perfectly, you, you can't normally preserve all of the uh, Heisenberg limit on that. So in theory, yes, you could do something like this, but um, in reality, it's maybe not so easy. But the key thing is that uh, we want to consider mostly 50-50 uh, type unitaries where we're just going to be doing a lot of interference like this. Um, this is actually pretty easy to realize. Um, I say easy, it can be hard to align these things, but yeah, we'll assume that this is like a really key tool that we want to use. So now, um, when I when I was hinting at earlier, this joint detection and someone in the chat also asked about it. Um, what we are looking at here is instead of using uh, each channel use just being one symbol, uh, let's assume that we're actually embedding our information into multiple symbols of, we'll still choose BPSK, but um, we're gonna say that two symbols is actually each of our codes. So um, now our X1 is sending two alphas, our X2 is an alpha and a minus alpha, and our X3 is a minus alpha and an alpha. Um, so if again, if I want to have my encoded information um, that I'm trying to send through, I'm physically going to put that into now two different coherent states that I'm sending. They could be temporally multiplexed, they could be spatially multiplexed, meaning that they could be one after each other in time, or they could be propagating simultaneously, um, but in different, say, wavelengths or frequencies or, or spatial mode. Um, now, uh, they're still going through the same lossy channel, um, and now, so I get some lossy version of those states uh, coming to my detector. But now I have a detector here, and the exact details of it um, are only partially relevant, but I'm performing a measurement where both of these states are coming in simultaneously. Um, I'm interfering them, kind of like in Homodyne. Um, and then in this case, uh, one arm is a direct detection and the other is an ideal Dolan R uh, to discriminate between if I'm given a, a phase shifted coherent state or not. Um, this receiver, we won't go through the calculation of all of it, um, but if you were to go through this and assign prior probabilities to each of your X1, X2, X3 um, that are parameterized by uh, this value P, um, what you would find is that maximizing the mutual information over those priors and normalizing it, considering that you're using two uh, coherent states, so you need to normalize for the energy that you're sending, what you'll find is that uh, in the limit of the low photon regime, where n is going towards zero, uh, the this receiver uh, paired with this modulation scheme uh, has a higher uh, rate of communication than the C1 capacity, than even if you had an ideal dole in our a receiver that was going through each one, one by one. So you're actually achieving a super additive capacity. You're you're taking uh, one bit plus one bit and you're getting slightly more than uh, two bits, which uh, seems a little unintuitive or maybe just outright wrong. But um, I think the best way to think about it has actually been alluded to in a lot of the questions that people have been asking about the shot noise limited um, measurement is if that's the only thing that's quantum. Well. In this case, what we're really doing is we're preserving the state of both of the coherent states, um, whatever code we've sent, and we're forcing it down to a single measurement um, that collectively then minimizes the, the shot noise here. Um, it's maybe not super obvious in this receiver, but uh, in the next one that I'll show, I think it'll be a little more clear how this actually happens. And so we're, we're taking advantage of the fact that we can preserve the state and still have the same vacuum noise type uh, shot noise limited measurement at the end to extract more information out of each of our codes that we're sending, rather than measuring them piecewise. So an example of an actual structured uh, joint detection receiver um, that now exists is called uh, the green machine or the optical green machine. Um, so this receiver takes a Hadamard BPSK codebook, um, where this would be an example of one of the codes. So in this code word, we have uh, eight, we have eight symbols that are all being sent. Um, and you can kind of see an example of the code book here where we're eliminating putting alpha each time, but we're just putting plus or minus to show it. So um, these codes uh, are orthogonal, but the coherent states themselves are not. So the, the states, you can't perfectly discriminate all of these. So even though a Hadamard code book uh, normally is orthogonal, uh, in this case, it's not because we're using uh, coherent state modulation. Um, we then use a structured series of linear transformations. So these can be thought of as idealized beam splitters. Uh, to transform what's originally a Hadamard BPSK codebook into a pulse position modulation type codebook, 
where all of the energy is effectively compressed into a single time bin or spatial mode. Uh, and then followed by direct detection, uh, you essentially have an unambiguous state discrimination where you're now able to tell uh, with much more clarity which state you were given. So um, in this case, if we have uh, M equals eight, so there's eight modes, uh, each of them having a coherent state of amplitude alpha, um, at the end, we're going to get this square root of eight times alpha amplitude pulse position modulation. So we're, we're, we're compressing all that energy and we're reducing it to a single measurement, uh, which will just be direct detection on this. Um, you can think of this as a, a fast hadamard walls transform. Um, and the name green uh, actually comes from uh, the first person who thought about uh, doing this type of computation or this type of circuitry with uh, analog circuits back in the 1960s for uh, the Mariner 9 missions. Uh, Richard Green. So this, the name is inspired from him, but instead of doing it uh, in a purely uh, like analog circuit, this is all done with optical transformations. Um, the capacity uh, is, we, we don't have to go through each step of this, but what I want to make clear is that um, the capacity calculation actually gives you a very clear cut um, outputs where you can analytically figure out what the capacity of a different size system would be. So um, we chose previously this uh, M equals eight Hadamard codebook, um, but it's you can choose any exponential scale of two um, and increase your codebook and increase the size of your system. So you could have two, four, eight, 16 onwards um, number of modes. And the calculation uh, basically goes like this. Like I know, sorry, I'll go back quickly, um, that my transition probability matrix, if I'm uh, considering the output code word Y is the same as the input X, then I have um, just the chance that I don't get the detection. Um, so one minus the, the no click. Um, whereas I always have um, the chance that I get that no click as being an erasure outcome. So I have a mapping of M inputs and M plus one outputs. So this is an erasure channel. Um, and so really in, for each input code word, um, when you're doing this calculation, um, each one of them is just a binary entropy because there's only two outcomes. Either you get the click where you expect it or you don't get a click at all and you map it to the erasure. Um, so yeah, this this is now, we have a capacity, an analytic expression for the capacity of the system. And so uh, we do need to normalize it by the number of symbols that we send because that keeps the energy normalization the same. And so um, what we find when we take the capacity that we just saw um, normalize it over uh, the amount of energy sent. So this is the photon information efficiency. Um, what we want to look for is in the low photon regime, how do we perform relative to uh, existing systems? So the black line here is the Haleva capacity for BPSK on a lossy channel. Um, so this is the ultimate goal that we're shooting for. Uh, the red dotted line here is actually the Dolinar receiver. So that would be an ideal symbol by symbol detection system. And homodyne and heterodyne, uh, homodyne or heterodyne is just a dual homodyne system, uh, are actually even lower. So we see homodyne down here at about two bits per photon, um, all the way from uh, n of about 0.1 uh, and continuing on down. Um, whereas with consecutively larger green machines, uh, we're able to push much beyond what is capable of being achieved in homodyne, as well as the dole on our receiver itself. So um, these systems, each have kind of an optimal area. So depending on how low the received photon number is that you're expecting to get, you might choose a different size receiver. Um, but no matter where you are, you can pick the right structured size receiver uh, to actually achieve this. And so um, this is, a, this is a, a structured receiver design that achieves a super additive capacity by leveraging the fact that you can take the incoming code words, compress them into a single measurement, which is just going to be direct detection on um, your pulse position modulation at the end, but it's really coming from this this compression of the earlier Hadamard codebook. So um, yeah, this receiver, although it doesn't achieve um, it doesn't achieve a label capacity, it does achieve super additive capacity. So this is um, yeah the, the really interesting aspect of the fact that if you take advantage of the quantum states, preserve them before your measurement, you're actually able to achieve a higher capacity than anything um, that's used today. So. Um, that's that's all I wanted to say about this. I'm, maybe there's a few questions, but um, what I wanted to do now is go back to the uh, code examples. So I'm going to uh, flip my screen over to that. Okay, um, should be able to see 
the code now. So um, same thing as before, if you have it open, uh, great. You just need to make sure that this first cell is run so that way we have all the proper packages. And we're gonna scroll down a bit until we see where it says section two starts here. Um, so the first uh, cell below that is just giving us some definitions of mutual information uh, in the binary entropy function, which we've already seen um, explained pretty thoroughly by TJU in the course here. Um, so this is just a nice function you can just call uh, to calculate the mutual information. Um, it assumes that you're given a conditional probability matrix, uh, not a joint probability matrix, which uh, can be important. Um, and then also the marginal for um, the uh, input symbol X. Um, the binary entropy just takes the value of P. Um, so that's to be expected. And both of them will return either the mutual information or the, uh, the binary entropy. So um, earlier we showed how to sample from homodyne uh, using strawberry fields. And we're going to use that same function that we used before, BPSK, sample homodyne. Um, but now we're going to use it to calculate a transition probability matrix. And from there, the mutual information uh, given a specific amplitude alpha. So uh, again, we're going to tell it to sample. Um, we're going to just create a transition probability matrix uh, array. And then we're going to give it alpha. You can choose a different value here. Um, if you choose a lower value, you'll get lower mutual information. Um, but then for each of the two possible code words, so alpha and minus alpha, uh, we're going to go through and just sample uh, sample again. And then just as we saw before, we're doing a thresholding. So if the value is greater than zero, we're going to map it back to uh, the plus alpha. And if it's less than zero or else, uh, we're going to map it to the minus alpha. So uh, let's run this, move this down by one value. Uh, And what we should see in a few seconds here um, is a printout that gives us both the transition probability matrix as well as the mutual information. So there's the TPM. Oh, no. Oh, I didn't define it. That's uh, my mistake. Yeah, let me run this. And run this again. Cool. There we go. So, yeah, uh, we see that along uh, the vertical here, we have uh, this top row, which is going to be uh, x equals 1, or this would be like uh, the alpha. So we mapped to the right one 98% of the time. And then same thing for the minus alpha, we mapped properly 98% uh, of the time. And that gives us some mutual information of uh, 0.86, uh, well, I guess, yeah, 0.87 uh, bits per channel use. So this allows you then, um, you, could you could choose to change your alpha here. You could actually plot this similar to the one below, where um, below I have the analytical expressions for all that we saw to map the green machine versus Dolinar, homodyne, and heterodyne. Um, so you could go in and you could uh, actually just functionalize this and run it over the same values of uh, n that I'm using down below, which is this mean value array. Um, and then you could compare uh, the sampling that you have. And what you should find is that it'll match very, very closely uh, to this homodyne line here. So um, that is all I have for uh, the second section of code. But what it gives you is a tool to really quickly get the mutual information and the binary entropy, um, and then a general strategy for sampling uh, using strawberry fields. So again, this, this code right here, this BPSK sample homodyne, uh, this is calling back to the sampling we did earlier, which gave us, I don't seem to have it in here, um, gave us just drawing a distribution um, to say uh, what the value was from the measurement. So um, I will stop sharing here, and I think there's some questions in the chat. So Let's maybe address those. So let's try to conclude what we were doing. Um, Jack, uh, I can do the conclusion, right? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and I'll start uh, answering questions. Yeah, sorry, I should have clarified that. Right. So let me share my screen again. <clears throat> can you just confirm whether the right, whether the right screen is being shared? Uh, yep, it is. Okay, good. All right, so we are at the end of our course, and uh, where are we now? So we started with a you know uh, a graphic you know description of what a channel is, it's, uh, transmitting and receiving, and uh, all the time what we have noticed is that there is an encoding pro encoding process here, you know, and then we use light. Uh, there's a, at the end, there's a channel, Shannon channel, classical channel. And uh, 
there is a detection mechanism happening here and you get the output too, right? What we were concentrating at this part and uh, we were describing uh, different modulation formats, okay? Mainly on-off keying initially for zero and alpha, then BPSK for alpha and minus alpha. Then we discussed uh, uh, receivers, uh, Dolinar uh, with the ML det detection. Initially, we dis discussed uh, photon number counting with uh, ideal direct detection, okay, with uh, ML de uh, detection, uh, decision rule, and homodyne detection. And then we talked about uh, joint correct, uh, de joint detection receivers, sure. And uh, what we have seen, what we, what we have learned from all these things we have done, okay. So we have learned the following. Fundamental efficiency of encoding the information in a photon is a function of how we encode the information and how we choose to detect the information. Okay? So the encoding and detection both plays a role in the you know, efficiency of uh, sending information using quantum objects. The quantum physics tells us that there is an inherent noise in the detection mechanism, no matter what you use. Okay, There is always uh, errors involved, it's not perfect, the statistics of how the noise manifests itself on corrupting the information as we extract it from the light is a function of how we choose to detect it. This is another thing. Then, uh, neither it is it is not necessary. So we have seen that the Dolinar is the best detector for a BPSK, but it doesn't achieve the Holevo capacity. You know, so by neither of the detectors for Dolinar or Homodyne achieves the optimal performance with any of the encoding formats. When we go to communications, even the Dolinar detector, the best theoretical detector is not the best possible receiver that can maximize the rate at which we can communicate information. That's an impo important as aspect here. <clears throat> joint direct, we have seen that doing joint detection receivers perform better than the simple by simple uh, detection. A general problem is that how do we process the light? For example, uh, what can we do before detection? Okay, what can we do? What kind of a encoding we do? What kind of a detection mechanism we use so that our efficiency in transmitting the information is maximized? This is our general problem. We just saw a few examples of this thing. This is a huge, vast area of study. Uh, we welcome all of you here to to seek you and to do more research on this, more collaborations on this, and. Uh, I wish you all a good time ahead. Thank you so much for joining us.